Hello everyone, it's 2019. Welcome to the return of By The Numbers. I'm your host Richard Lewis, that's Duncan Thorin Shields. We were just talking about what we were doing on New Year's Eve. We must be getting old, mate. Must be. Between you getting high, me having a few quiet drinks. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, do you miss the party days at all, Duncan? The wild days? Exist. I actually um, did see a Reddit thread. And this is how you know if you're high enough. Is that I saw a Reddit thread that was in like, you know, a community of like psychonauts or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And the actual title of the thread was like, in the Bible, God is called <laughs> the most high. And it's like, <laughs> whoa, what is he saying? <laughs> what is he saying? <clears throat> that actually, well, you know. that bakes my noodle. No, I believe it, mate. <laughs> Spam. <laughs> Fucking hell. Not because the yeah. idea is that brilliant, but because, you know, my noodle was already 75% <laughs> before, <laughs> before I hit that topic. And that just put me nicely over the edge, didn't it? So. Man, I haven't had a good fucking, like, you know, those stupid stoned conversations you have where it's like, you know, it's like just philosophy for morons. I just haven't had me and you do that. I can already <laughs> tell you. <laughs> You're right, actually. Yeah. In fact, you do know that that is essentially, I've already figured it out, Richard. That's essentially, if they ever stop making it, like, say esports dies out so much that everyone who currently makes a living in esports isn't making a good living anymore. If yeah. there are two people tailor made for a cut, for like a, how would you describe it? Fuck, what's the name of that term where it's like you design something especially just for someone? Like when you her, make a her, not bespoke. Her there we go. Bespoke, bespoke. That's it. Like a bespoke her service. Hairy, I think. If there were ever two people <laughs> born to be part of a bespoke service where you call them up while high and have them talk to you about ridiculous shit that would be epic to talk about while high. I think DDK and Anders are just basically like just shoe-ins for this job. They would kill this job completely, wouldn't they? Imagine oh, you can just call them at any point in time, and they're just like, oh, hi, yeah. what, what what do you want now, a seven? Seven, right. And there's obviously just any moment in time. Just back Listen, to the time man, <laughs> just comes in. Well, I've said this, like I said, uh, the On Fire project was criminally underused. Now, if they pivoted and basically made it like a sort of 24-hour talk radio station <laughs> where it was just non-stop call-ins, you could just like, they just did it in like four-hour blocks, you know? DDK's on, uh, fucking Anders is on, Moses is on, Samuel's on. This would be sick if Vince is on. I'd love to fucking do this. Because the thing is as well, because there's such a broad spectrum of personalities, like you've got Anders who just is basically the human interpretation, like the personification of psychedelic drugs, which is weird because I don't actually think he's no, done any. No, barely taken any of these. Yeah, but barely. barely. <laughs> <laughs> but the ones he did fucking just projected him into the shadow realm and oh, he never came that back. That was yeah, Dan is like just there's so much going on in terms of like he tries to assimilate all thoughts and ideology simultaneously into a holistic worldview that it's mind boggling. And then you got guys like Vince who you can just call up for like I don't know relationship advice. Ah, uh, you're being fucking treated like a plum, you damn quad <laughs> man. You know what I mean? Relationship advi Ooh, advice with Vince to be fucking man. bagging the Vince cells. Where well, are you fucking talking about, like? You know what I mean? I'd fucking love that shit. I'd f they should do it, man. I'm thinking these, of knocking all this spot. fucking commentating on the head, like. <laughs> oh, shit, never mind, it. like. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting a I'm fucking... Getting Mate, you make him sound like Jimmy Nail. Oh, it's not major, can't do, like. I can't do that accent, mate, so I don't know. I know exactly. Yeah, fucking major. I'll tell you what, I'll do one game, and then I'm fucking out, all right? <laughs> Get uh, the fucking well, chicken in if you want. <laughs> no, I'm fucking like that, like, so I'm coming back. Yeah, Vince, never went away, man. By anyway. the way, speaking of which, the movie they never yeah. made while they were in their prime, obviously, is I'd love to see the movie Cheech and Chong on fire, in which they become commentators, obviously <laughs> modelled on the life of Anders Plum. <laughs> left out of their minds on a mixture of painkillers and the best chronic available. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. Hey, similar man, you want to smoke at this blunt, man? That'd be fucking good. I'll be, I'll be on board. Someone and then obviously the, the similar dude's like, I'm so sick. Oh my God, this weed is so sick, bro. Oh, God. <laughs> right, anyway. Uh, th this podcast, we'll talk about Counter-Strike in a bit. Oh, and, if we uh, must, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and, I know, these fucking people paying us to it's, talk it's about It's not like some things. shit version of like the first 10 seasons of fucking, what was it called, Family Guy, where every single scene's just like, but what about if, insert guy from the 80s, did something <laughs> with a guy from the 90s, and an activity you'd never expect either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then it's like, right, can we pay for that? Sound. <laughs> yeah. F fuck that show. And fuck the guy. What's the name of the guy who writes it as well? Seth, Seth MacFarlane. 
What By the way, can I just go? Can I just go ahead and say this right now? Yeah. Seth MacFarlane yeah. is one of those dudes who simultaneously tries to be some sort of professional comedian, but also tore the sort of walk line of like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Despite the fact, again, the first ten seasons of Family Guy, I'm pretty sure the gag is like, Haha, he's gay. It's like that's like a <laughs> joke, like ninety percent of gags for the first ten seasons. So I don't really know how you can manage these things. But as we learned a long time ago, Richard, different rules for thee than for me. Yeah. What was that fucking film he did? A million ways to die in the West, or whatever it was called. It is yeah, fucking sorry. terrible. I've never it heard is of that one. one. What is that, mate? Like, I think it's, 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 it's what you need to do. Is it? I think it is. Uh, I can't remember, I mate. Know. But but hey, hey, take whatever you need. Take your medicine. Watch that fucking movie. Will it that make is... it funny though? No. Well, you you'll have meta comedy because you'll realize it's trying to make you laugh, and even right. on strong weed, you're not laughing. So that will in turn make you laugh. It is fucking terrible it is terrible he can't act he's not funny the joke's terrible like there's a recurring joke about people shitting in a hat it's got sarah silverman and playing a prostitute uh, it, it's ridiculous but, it, but it, not on but unironically <laughs> <laughs> that could have been an so incredible anyway. meta contextual <laughs> joke richard so, keep so going. anyway <laughs> this podcast is sponsored by rivalry you can go to rivalry <laughs> <laughs> Qualified with the three hundred and fifty dollars of uh, VIP bonuses, and if you want to go to the Thunderdome, which, which uh, wasn't that that like battle to the death, yeah, in yeah. Mad Max Mad three, Max. Yeah. check yeah, the other yeah. day. It's still live. I'm pretty sure the event. So. All right, okay, well, yeah, yeah, check it out. Go to rivalry.gg, the Thunderdome, where you don't have the battle to the death, but you do have a chance to win a hundred thousand dollars. And of course, make sure you're eighteen plus, and please bet responsibly. How is that for a plug? I, I'm I'm going to take the plugs more seriously in 2019. I've decided. Got to um, got to got to raise my game. Right. So let's talk about Counter Strike. We've wasted enough time. We'll get back to Seth MacFarlane later. But uh, I wanted to start by talking about you know in, in my Trumpian way. I want to talk about China, China. Because there was a front page post on Reddit, just just came in like 12 hours ago when I was prepping the show. And this is what I've been saying the whole time. There was the news that Flash uh, Flash Gaming, you know, were disbanding and, and moving on. And the guy who sort of uh, had founded the team uh, had put this like, tw uh, you know, message out on Weibo or Weabu or whatever the fuck it's called. <laughs> And uh, yeah. Yeah, we Abu will work <laughs> for me. <laughs> yeah, the we Abu's are back, boys. Um, but anyway, this fucking it, it just confirms everything I've been saying about the Chinese CSGO. I mean, I, I don't know why anybody thought it would be different. I, we'll get onto the Tai Lu situation where everybody sort of just has conveniently forgotten that Captain Mo, like, pretty much put tweets out there where he was engaging in a conversation with a match fixer discussing the possibility of fixing a match and then like sort of everybody just swerved and ignored when that because we all like tyler uh this was like uh end of last year oh, um fucking hell, that recent not like before they became pro no no well no but the screenshots were from like 2015 or something right okay but i mean like we, we've already shown there's no statute of limitations oh, on bullshit oh. right but everybody's just turned a blind eye. That it raised so his statement about how he wanted to stay away from match fixes and all that raised a lot of questions because it, it basically intimated that maybe Tyloo players they'd at least had conversations where they expressed an interest at the very least, right? So everybody just turns a blind eye to that because it's China, and you just have to fucking pretend that, like, you know, oh well, yeah, it's just a world unto itself where anyone can do anything. But check this out. This statement here says, uh, after I entered the Chinese CSGO scene, I began to realize the reality is far from the esports dream. By the way, there is no esports dream, kids. It's just one long nightmare, <laughs> right? Okay, so good. Glad we cleared that up. Uh, money is way more tempting than the joy, happiness, and glory from winning a trophy by one's own efforts. The distributor of the game, which uh, apparently this refers to Perfect World rather than Val, sure. turns a blind eye to the dark and shady things happening in the scene. Throughout the two-year journey, I learned the presence of unspoken rules in the industry that are shocking and unheard. As far as I know, currently there are people paying players from other teams to match fix, using cheats in matches, trying to call out spots in a LAN environment, threatening players' safety at LANs, and most hilariously, cutting internet cables, which of course... That's what happened with the whole flash internet cable getting cut, you know, during the Asia Minor qualifier with that bullshit team that had a cheat on cheater on the roster. 
Uh, I've even heard that some teams pay around tens of thousands uh, in Chinese yen for the GoTV IP that allows them to spectate 10 players on the server with zero delay in online matches and claim that they can win or lose according to their wish. Now, that's very plausible, because I'm sure you remember, Duncan, that same thing was happening in StarCraft 2 and that was over in Korea, and, and that was related to a Chinese betting syndicate where they were having like private lobbies with no delay so they could sort of bet in real time and, and beat the system, beat the bookies that way. So I... I believe believe this uh, and then he goes is this really esports is there still a need for competing since when did we have to use shady methods to win i heard that there will be way less tournaments in china next year it is not a coincidence that chinese csgo went from one land per day in 2015 and 2016 to almost no tournaments now but rather something that's bound to happen as no one took the initiative to take care of the stuff i listed above the chinese csgo scene is ill so I wanted to get your thoughts on this because I've been talking about this for ages and it seems to me, the, you know, when you get to a position where you're talking about perfect world, just basically turning a blind eye to it, Valve turning a blind eye to it, I think the health of the Chinese scene is vitally important to the sort of broader ecosystem. But let's be honest, I would probably say, you know, at a conservative estimate, there's some fuckery going on with about 50% of Chinese competitive games on some level, whether it's some form of cheating, irregular betting patterns, players betting on their own matches, out-and-out -out match fixes, people having access to private GoTV IPs, DDoSing. It's a fucking joke. I mean, the whole, the whole scene is rotten to the fucking core, and I don't know what you do about it. I don't know how you fix that. I mean, the obvious place it starts for me is the fact that think of every other big esports game. So Overwatch with like trying to stop people boosting accounts, League of Legends, obviously they've wanted to stop like scripters and these things. Think of the stories over the last few years where like, for example, I believe in Korea, someone who made like some sort of a cheat or like script for League of Legends actually got sued. Mm. People That's in the correct, West yes. have obviously had literally things taken against them who were like match fixers, obviously, et cetera. The difference is you couldn't, as far as I'm aware, you could not do these things in China. Like unless you had insanely high level pull on like, we're talking almost above a business level, like a political level, you will simply not get the Chinese government, as far as I can tell, to enforce things like copyright, IP rights, et cetera. So as a result, unfortunately, Valve can't step in and be the big daddy and say, right, we're going to fix all this. I mean, as Captain Moore suggests there, it's not even up to Valve. Like, it's perfect world who handles CSGO within China. And even then, they're, they're very like, unlikely to pursue these things. They're just going to distribute the game and then, you know, the game will it'll be the wild, wild west. The game will have to police itself. So I don't really see a way you avoid it because, I mean, you and I know that these things go on in the West. I mean, particularly, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. There's a whole bunch of that shit still goes on to this day in the CIS region because they, in their own way, have similar problems on a political level and a government level where, like, who are you going to report someone to that's going to get them arrested in Russia or something? It's not going to happen, is it? So, mm. unfortunately... Like whenever you leave like room for these things to happen, especially when they know there's no oversight, it's going to happen. Like it's going to happen anywhere. People, that's the thing about it. All areas. Like I've I've made this point before, but I once read someone who tried to explain why in every country in the world there will always be smuggling, right? And his point was such a shrewd one because his point was this, like no matter how like difficult you make it to smuggle things in, logically, the more difficult it gets, the higher the premium of the price you can then charge for the thing you smuggle in. Therefore, your price of what you can get for the goods scales. And so as it scales, you can then pay the appropriate bribe to the person who's the guard who you want to smuggle it past. And therefore, it will always happen. It doesn't matter if you make it the most illegal thing ever. It won't happen as much, but there will still be people smuggling. So on the same level, I think things like cheating, match fixing, like literally just abusing scenarios like this, they're all going to happen in every area and unfortunately in these areas china being a particular example it's basically going to be widespread and just open because there's no one to stop it as far as i can tell like think about the only people i'm aware of who've even punished chinese people is like when IEM came along and they kicked out that QZ guy who was in Tai Lu because he'd had a cheating record, it's, it's actually yeah. mainly the Western people who come in and host a tournament and uh, therefore have some say of it so personally i'm sorry i don't have any sort of optimism that this is going to stop anytime soon and then you add in that in csgo at least in china isn't like the main esport i think that's a lot of the reason why people even give a fuck about that esport in china is to do these illegal activities unfortunately yeah i think you might be honest i'm in there i mean for me i think there's something bigger going on you know and the idea that that perfect world are running some sort of uh uh cover to kind of because look nobody wants it to be scandalized 
right? Not in China, you know. I mean, that's the last thing anybody would want. The government would sort of be compelled to come in at that point and have to do something. I'm sure they'd rather not have to do that. I'm sure Perfect World don't want that kind of press for their business, for the game, for esports as a whole in China. Already a lot of scrutiny um, around games titles and censorship going on over there. But there was a weird thing that happened again towards the end of the last year. Back, back when this Tai Lu match fixing stuff, it was like literally a week later. Uh, back when Captain Mo had sort of openly spoken about being approached to fix matches and put out, uh, you know, uh, weeaboo DMs where he was fucking basically entering into a conversation and somehow this just didn't incriminate him at all in the eyes of the community, which which I thought was very strange. Uh, there was also some VAC bans. There was, and, and it was reported in the Western press that the largest private cheat in China had been detected and it affected some pro-level players. You know, I think uh, QZ or an associate of QZ got VAC banned again. And all these VAC bans went away. They were actually and, and removed? They, yes, removed, yeah. And uh, like overturned, they disappeared. Loads of people were saying that they were false positives. That's very dodgy. Yeah, yeah. And it was oh. like people, yeah, people were just like, no more has been written about it. No more has been spoken about it. Well, that that made me well, really. Well, that makes me quite ask this though, Richard. Do you know then, like, for example, if a ban is, I'll give you a great example. Everyone remembers who was around a few years ago when that Bulgarian team GG player had that player. Yeah. I forget who it was. Was it was it Dreamer? Dreamer was the, the one Dreamer. that actually got Dreamer. the ban. Yes. Yeah, okay. Dreamer was the one who got back banned. Yeah. So he was the one that got banned, right? And the team itself actually was like approaching a decent level. So it was interesting news, right? And at the time, I know this must have happened to you, everyone else who wasn't Dreamer in this team reached out to everyone else, like, please, he's innocent. Like, you must raise attention. Like, you know, this is this is wrong. It's a miscarriage of justice. And what I said to the person who reached out to me was, okay, I'll look into your case, but I will say that Valve does have a very good track record of when it is a mistake and people report it to them, actually, like, fixing the scenario, like, as far as I'm aware, most people who ever got like left with the ban, it turned out like they were just lying to me. Like, you know, they were telling me, no, no, I was just, but like when Valve's looked on their end, it's like, no, this totally stands up. You know, this person definitely did use the cheats. So, in the same sense as though, in that scenario, if that guy didn't get unbanned, personally, outside of Valve, and I assume he probably did cheat or you let someone access his account, you know, if it happens in China, do you, is, is it actually Valve, the company who still checks it, do you think? Or do well, you think exa well, yeah, exactly. This is where I start to ask some questions because I would have no way of knowing that. Yeah. But because of the nature of the partnership, it does, it does beg the question. It's someone, else, right? someone within the Chinese region who's mm. doing this. And obviously, they're not beholden to the same ethics as Valve sure. necessarily. And, and before we get into you know conspiracy theories, there's a chance it was false positives. Okay. Uh, you, know, you know, obviously, they've happened historically in the past. There was a... Uh, for example, a period of time way back where ESCA, uh, the ESCA client was triggering false positives uh, for a time, which also coincided with a, a private cheat getting detected. So that created a lot of... And luckily, uh, when that happened, though, the guy said, like, look, I wasn't cheating. And then LPK <laughs> like, ran back through every, like, <laughs> and binary on machine code on his PC and said, actually, yeah, you're right. Actually, you didn't use your cheats there. So you're free yeah, to go. Yeah. But you're anyway, go. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to uh, short, short this uh, stock that your company's involved in that's going down. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, you know, look, I, I, think, I think there's something, uh, you know, look, Valve have put themselves in this fucking weird position when it comes to china they did the same in dota i made this point on a recent podcast i did with nahaz where we were talking about it where it's like okay so you have a team liquid player come out and say oh the world would have been a better place if hitler had eradicated all the russians this is one of the best places i believe in the world it was meant to be teams. hyperbole but he did still say that <laughs> yes yeah oh, oh yeah okay i mean it's obviously hyperbole sure he Heated game of Still crazy that you want to champion said it. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, I mean, like you know, and 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 to be clear, completely fucking unacceptable. Uh, uh, you know. So, but then when you have uh, you know, cuckoo drop a, a derogatory term about the Chinese language, um, and, and ahead of events in China, Valve have kind of had to side with the Chinese tournament organizers, local Chinese government and effectively implement an exclusion policy on those players. Meanwhile, there are multiple other Dota players that are going to compete at those tournaments, all fine and dandy, uh, having said worse things. Uh, having having used the you know guys like Ice 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 who you know um, said that he didn't like his first name because it was an N-word name. I mean, these are outrageous statements. I, you know, it's oh, mind-blowing yeah. to me that anybody would say something like this. Um, 
but they're all fine to compete in China because it, it didn't mock the Chinese. Valve have effectively come in and backed that up and sanctioned that stance. Fuck and now we're in, yeah, and, and now we're in a position like you know where... what, for anyone who doesn't understand the key difference here. By the logic that if you said something that was offensive about Chinese people, you can't play at the Chinese major. I Sai Sai should now never be playing in a North American tournament. That exactly. He should never be. In, I mean, the international this year is in China, you know, but he should never be in the future. By that same logic, they could ban yeah. him. Like, obviously not. Yeah, and, and this is what I mean. It's like, and, and now we we see, we're starting to see the the matter of Chinese hypocrisy, or rather Valve's kind of stance because of the nature of China. And, I, and listen, I don't think Valve can do anything. No, that's why but, I alluded to it at the beginning. I think it's yeah. their pay grade in that sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But unfortunately, we're now we, we've got a position where it's been absolutely stated unequivocally that the iPad Power guys are never going to be unbanned. You know, it's been four years or whatever it's been now. Uh, most of you know and there's still two of them that have potentially promising careers and, and and they can never compete in a major because of what is in the grand scheme of things a very minor mistake a very minor error of judgment uh, meanwhile you have systemic match fixing you have the captain for the biggest chinese team coming out basically re incriminating himself releasing his own logs you've got team owners coming out and saying the chinese cs scene is a sewer you know we had uh you know ch cheaters a pro match fixing this guy could probably bring down an entire house of cards you will not hear one peep about it from valve and and i and i just think it's so fucked up because of the nature of the chinese government and, and chinese business and the need to do business with china one of the largest growing economies if not the uh, largest growth of gdp uh, of any economy in the world you know they, everyone needs to do business with these guys so fuck fairness fuck an egalitarian approach to these problems and you're going to actually see a bunch of chinese players probably at a pro level who are going to have got away with match fixing and ultimately <clears throat> i also think if valve would tackle this issue head on now we would start entering into a, a realm that's very important for the match fixing discussion i see a lot of childlike approaches to it where people go oh you know right from wrong and if you uh, ever fix a match you should be banned for life valve did the right thing with i buy power fuck match fixes forever now, okay, I, in principle, I agree with that. But this is China. What if it's organized crime? What if, I mean, uh, in the Captain Mo uh, uh, um, DMs that were released, there was threats involved. It was strongly intimated that there would be repercussions for him if he didn't go along with it. Right? Now, what happens there? I mean, you know, if someone's threatening you, your family, your career, you know, threatening to... Uh, you know, falsify evidence about you that would scandalize you, give you a bad reputation. It, it, is that person, if you then acquiesce to those demands, are you as bad as somebody that does it for motivations of straight up greed? You know, should, in, in, in what happens in regular sports is if, if someone is forced into it or coerced, generally the sentencing is a lot more lenient. And this is definitely going on in China. It's definitely going on in all of Asian esports. We've seen it in South Korea. You know, and I, 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 I just think. It seems to me that you can't like that, that. There's a purposeful avoidance of this big problem, and I've said it. Until China gets its shit in order, we like probably should fucking, you know. I I, I hate to sound again like a fucking marker hat wearing asshole, but there has to be an isolationist policy, right? Like, I mean, we can't just I allow do think people. There's a big problem with that actually, which is as you're yeah. alluding to, it's not even. Here's the thing, okay. In a lot, like, I'm I'm ignoring the CIS region when I talk about the West here. Obviously, like I don't mean you mean the West of the whole globe. I mean the West is in like Western Europe, United States, places that are more similar to cultures I'm familiar with. Therefore, I know the etiquette and I know the way things run. Right? Generally, when things in the West didn't come out, that's because no one was able to run that story down, or you know the person involved wouldn't come forwards or whatever. There's not like generally though widespread conspiracy, or even just the intimation about you better not say anything about. This. No, if you if you like, as you saw in the I buy power scenario, what were the mm. actual repercussions for bringing that story forward? Okay, yes, yeah, some people hated on you, but you didn't get your whole job wrecked. No one killed you. You know, like the, it's still fairly low, sort of like threat level for doing that. In some of these other areas, it's not just that these things are covered up. It's that you better not speak out about these things. Like yeah. I've, told, I've mentioned this before. I have heard stories from very credible people years ago in like in Korean League of Legends, where a couple of high profile people taking part in match fixing. And when I said to the person, 
So when's this story going to come out? They're like, oh, that'll never come out. I go, well, what do you mean? Like, Listen, you tell me, you know, what, which, who do I have to get the journalist to talk to? Who do I have? And they said, no, you have to understand, no one will ever talk about this. Like, the whole point is, it's like that. I, I always give the analogy of, if you remember the, when that guy, Ahmadinejad, the guy who was mm. the president or whatever of Iran, yeah, you, yeah. like about like 10, 15 years ago, he went and did a load of like American news shows, if you remember. Like, he went on like, I think he even went on like the fucking Daily Show or something mental like, you know, he went on like a bunch of American news networks shows and when people asked him well how do you resolve the fact that you know like your country it, for religious reasons is very against homosexuality and as a result you know it can't sort of be like legalized and he just said what do you mean there are no gay people in iran that's the way people literally <laughs> yeah, behave rich that. in china yeah. and korea about like match fixing and cheating mm. well, there is not they go, well no no i can prove there isn't no, no you aren't understanding son there isn't any <laughs> so leave it at that that's really the message you get from these scenes it's fucked up yeah yeah, and, and, and like I say, I mean, you know, I, I don't know what it does for competitive integrity in a broader context, right? Like, you know, you've got players that are going to international tournaments. Well, who knows who they're talking to back home in China? What what websites are placing bets on these games? You know, like, I'm not saying Tyler are engaged in anything, sh you know, shady or untoward. Certainly not now. Uh but again, you know, if 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 these if this is the type of company you're keeping, if these are the type of conversations you're having, if your door is always open to somebody that will say, hey, you want to fix this match? You got some money for you? I can do this for you. I can do that for you. If you do not sever that association as a professional player, rightly so, there will always be question marks about your form, your games. And we all know, you know these Chinese teams are all over the place, up and down, beating international teams at an international event one minute, going back home and losing to a team of complete unknowns the next. And everyone's telling me, you know, I, my DMs are flooded every day about China. You know, every day is an exaggeration. Every week about Chin Chinese matches, and it's like, look at the, look at these, look at the odds and how they've swung over the last hour. You know, and, well, the you thing know, already that that like this is an example I always give of why I hate stuff like that even existing. It's the same thing with the cheating angle. I've made this point before. I don't. I, in one point six, if a player came along, I'll give you a great example when like Mark Love first became amazing for Navi. Okay, it did actually look, no joke, like in a three-month span, this guy became one and a half times better than he was. And he'd already played as a pro for, you yeah. know, a couple of years already. He'd been into, But part of it was, you know, he was on a better team and he had a better setup and he was everything was everything was as it perfectly should be to be at his best, right? So luckily, when he became amazing, I could just think in my mind, wow, he's this is perfect. He's improved. He's got the right team for him. I never, ever had to think for one second, you know, what if he's just cheating? What if he's just cheating his tits off and that's why he's way better? But when when this scenario happens, I can see a score. I have to start thinking that about certain people I've seen come along out of nowhere now. And then it's the same thing with match fixing. Like, as you're saying that there, Rich, about the fact that this match fixing is so prevalent, like, people understand that it could be going on within China. But even though I have no reason to speculate it goes on for Tyloo's team internationally, oh, what's the app? Tyloo's team in 2018, the, the theme of their team was the most ridiculous upset potential out of nowhere at any time in the best of one, followed by if they ever did do the mad upset. So let's say they beat someone of the level of like MIBR, someone, you know, big name. They also were very famous for then being able to lose to anyone in the next match. They could also go and get 16 2 by the biggest bombs from CIS ever. No, not Zeus. You know, like any old shitters could also thrash them. If I now yeah. know that in the background of this, the ambience of their scene is that it's full of match fixing. Now I'm already having to start thinking about that. Like, was the match fixing going on there? Do I even have to worry about that? Do we have to reconsider? Like, you don't want this to even be a, a problem, do you? Because it just ruins the integrity of the fucking games. Yeah, and, and like, I, I don't know what the solution is, obviously, to to the international problem in terms of you know chinese teams coming and competing in the national tournaments where you'd like to believe that would certainly be free of the pressures to to uh throw and 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 fix matches but i i've said it to the guys over at ESIC, uh the esports integrity coalition and and, and uh, you know i think it's the recommendation that they go forward with all betting sites should just shun chinese games you know because because if you want to bet on that shit domestically Fine, that's one thing. It's hermetically sealed. But once the 
contagion starts fucking spilling outwards and you've got you know regular betting sites oh look there's a chinese super league game on between you know two random chinese teams <clears throat> we should definitely take bets on that no because those two teams probably have a fixer who is watching and monitoring all of the odds and which sites are going to make them the best returns and he goes to those teams and he tells them you win this one tonight <coughs> that's literally how it goes down i mean you know at, at every uh every instance of match fixing the players always talk about how like some shadowy you know millionaire just comes in and says yeah this is how it this is how it's happening and it's not like a bunch of american kids in their bedrooms wanting to get a few extra skins yeah you know it's this is the, this another is reason, far more sinister another reason why you will see so few match fix uh so few whistleblowers come forward like part of the reason it, like captain moore's doing now is because the guy's fucking retiring like he's not going to be a pro player anymore he's going to be loosely associated with the same uh, coach or something you know like he's not it, now's his chance to do it but there's another thing about why for Asian countries, I'm really disturbed by it because I know that if you're in a team in one of those Asian countries, it ain't like being on cloud nine for a year and then once your contract ends, it's like, well, I'm not a cloud nine player anymore. Do whatever the fuck I want. No, you play for these teams. And as you saw with Tai Lu, you're their property. You're like, that's like you're just an, yeah. a low level employee of their company. So you're not going to speak out against the top level people in your company. Because the other thing I noticed within the Asian scene, which was very disturbing, is that it wouldn't be like lone bad actors who were just match fixing and they were doing it themselves. They almost always had someone within their team who was involved in it, like a, a manager who'd been turned or some corrupt guy who was like uh, someone in the team house with them who's pressuring other players to do it. So the other aspect is their cultural component will also keep a fucking lid on a lot of that shit and pressure people who otherwise would never even have considered doing it before. And look, there's other issues within China. It's not just match fixing. I mean, like, I remember like a year ago uh, when the Tai Lu players wanted, they expressed an interest in leaving the organization. So Tai Lu, basically, the parent company for Tai Lu, spoke to every tournament organizer in China that they had dominion and control and influence over and said, listen, we're benching these players for trying to get a better deal for themselves. You will not allow them to play at your tournaments if they do join another team. And they effectively froze them out. Now, again, I know Valve, a very pro player. If a North American organization had done something like that, Valve would have been on the fucking phone to them saying, you know, if it was Dota, you don't come to international. If it's CS, you're not coming to the major. Absolutely. I, I'm pretty confident of that in my gut, although I can't speak for Valve. What I, what I will say is, what should have happened there is the international, because these guys can't join the Players Association. They play in China. Good luck with that. What should have happened there is the international community should have said, Tyloo, as long as you continue to fucking treat your players like that, you don't come to our tournaments and get a piece of our money. That's what should have happened in that instance. Yeah. But again, it didn't. And, and, you know, people will just not address the issues within the Chinese scene. They treat their players like fucking garbage. Uh, you know, there's so much cronyism, corruption, match fixings rife. Like, and, and no one is interested in getting a hold on this. Like nobody at all. They also have a really big problem, I can tell you, in Chinese esports. No one speaks about this because, again, it's like the Brazilian thing. Everyone knew who'd seen Brazilian CSGO fans, how terrible they are. But why would anyone want to say it publicly? You see what happens. You just draw a target on your back. Same thing with Chinese esports fans. They have some of the worst fans I've ever seen in the history of esports. And especially for taking that angle of, like, if I like a person, they can't have done anything wrong. So in this particular scenario, I know that the backlash against Attacker and some of those guys who went and made the Flash gaming team and have now come back to Tai Lu, they didn't get anyone who was like, well, you know, do what's best for you. I understand. No, no, everyone was like, you piece of shit. You betrayed the team. You're a traitor. You should never play Counter Strike again. You should be banned from esports. Like the worst sort of fans were the loudest. And, and on those sorts of angles, they have a very, as you can see, you'd never let fans decide like a fuck. It would be like letting the public decide like a cop hearing like oh yeah well if they think they're guilty then he's probably just guilty yeah give him tender life like you wouldn't do that but that's the way it runs because think about this if Ty Lu didn't like what those players were doing nah, no problem just go to some sort of official capacity get them oh what that's that because you can't do that in your scene you're just going to do it yourself well in that case what are you complaining about like either you have contracts you can enforce or you don't it's the same yeah. problem we're all experiencing in the world you can't then just go and blacklist someone at the entire fucking industry as a way of like a gangster enforcing your contract. What is your contract only worth like you blacklisting someone? Like, what is the contract in that scenario? Like, play for my team or I will ruin your career. That's not a fucking contract. No. I, Where's like, the business side of this? Yeah. It, it, it's, it's so weird. And with everything else that's been going on, 
uh, and, and the sort of business expansion. Like, I just don't, I understand that principally this is a decision being driven by money, that the Valve Perfect World Partnership. I mean, the Perfect World Partnership, let's not forget what happened at the, again in Dota with the Shanghai Major, complete fucking disaster. And it was the firing of Too Good that completely overshadowed all of the other technical problems and how production effectively sold Too Good down the bus initially. You know, the fundamental problem there was that what got <laughs> on him the fired... river, but yeah, I know what you mean. Throw oh, him yeah, under the bus. Sold him on the bus is a very sold interesting him to the back metaphor. of the bus. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the fuck, man. I'm tired. I still have to do you wear it, But the whole slave trade and then the black people having to sit at the back of the bus, those are different eras. They weren't like connected in any way. He didn't sell yeah. someone down the bus. <laughs> It's just some right. good, yeah, Colonel Sanders looking. It, sold him down the river, morning, threw him under the bus. <laughs> so then, uh, sold the bus that he was yeah. thrown under yeah. uh, for for scrap parts, right? Uh, but yeah, basically, what happened there was, you know, this production uh, crew. There were so many technical fuck ups, sound fuck ups, errors. They had to keep too good on camera for longer. Well, it, look, with the way James operates, it's only a matter of time before he says something fucking crazy. And he made jokes about Chinese censorship on the internet, you know, types of porn he likes to watch. I mean, this was pretty shocking. But then the final straw that got him done for was the production guy in his ear was saying, we're going to cut to another break now. And he didn't want to do it because he felt he had a good conversation going on. And what's the point to go into 15 minute of fucking Twitch ads or a placing screen when we can actually talk? So he overruled the, the production guy. And that was what got, caused all the complaints because he didn't follow instructions. Now, that, that that event was a disaster of epic proportions, yet Valve still showed a willingness to move forward with the Perfect World Partnership because that is the people that handle all of their business in China. Yes. That's the relationship they have, and that's the relationship. You know, you can't go and cultivate another relationship. No, there's the key point, Tim. For anyone who's... In fact, that, that's a very good point in the context of all of this. For anyone who... Mm. Forget... Like, as bad as it is that the government won't do anything. So basically, you can get, find people literally doing crimes and defrauding people, and you probably can't get any government to do anything about it. Aside from that, even worse is the notion of, like you're saying here, well, the solution as a Westerner would be, well, this perfect world company doesn't seem like they're professional, doesn't seem like they do what they're doing. So you know what? Just switch to a different partner. There's another thing you cannot do in these Asian countries because something – like, I'll go ahead and guess – Probably whoever's involved with Perfect World has some sort of association with the ace people, who's the association of all the Chinese esports teams. And then, you know, then some high level Chinese esports teams are associated with them. So the level of cronyism is unbelievable, as in it is literally the limiting factor. You will not do events in China and Korea without greasing the right palms and basically letting people who, quite frankly, are incompetent work on the event. You must do it. Otherwise, you won't be allowed to do it. Because here's one of the reasons why. Even if you could run everything, they don't want you to be able to say, I went to China and just ran my own event all by myself. didn't need them. No. Even if you do every, even if you have all the event laid out, you better let some clown come along and have his name as like executive producer or some shit so that he can claim he did the event. And that's unfortunately the world we live in. And it doesn't matter. Even if you're Valve Software, you cannot get around this. There is no get around. This is working in a region where you don't make the rules and the rules are very different from your home region. Yeah. So it's like, I, on the one hand, I do sympathize with Valve because this is a, a huge market for them. They've got to make money. Uh, that's principally what they're about. They're not like one of these like public companies that are beholden to shareholders. They 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 do make really good products, really good games. I mean, Artifact didn't pan yeah, out the way fair, I thought it was going to. If, if you don't like the way that Valve's doing it, why don't you just make your own software company, <laughs> make a game like Counter that, Strike, yeah. become a publisher, yeah. then do your own business with China, and then don't let match fixes in. I mean, wouldn't that be easier, bro? Like you know. Yeah, you're right. You got you make a good point there. The millennial and um, me got got out there, Rich. Yeah, I, I saw that. I saw that. Um, but but yeah, so Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> <laughs> mate, did you see that Donald Trump tweet? That, that one was pure. That was answer. straight fire, that mate. That was unreal. Be, that was unreal. Be. Fair fucking play. I know uh, that was bad. Oh, the orange man was funny today. Um, anyway, so look, I, I don't know what Valve can do, but seriously, like, I think the international community has to address the fucking elephant in the room that right now, Chinese CSGO has got a lot of fucking problems. Everyone who is involved in it and then gets out of it, they all say the same thing, that it was a deluge of, you know, corruption, pressure on them. Like, somebody's got to try and step in. It should be Perfect World. If Valve are going to have a relationship with Perfect World, they've got to get something out of it beyond fucking money i can't respect that it's just money like surely 
it, it, it's like, you know, this policy of appeasement. You know, you let them do it, you let them do it, and then eventually you get to say, hey, Perfect World, could you maybe handle some of that match fixing now? You know, like, it, you've got to try and influence them to do the right thing. And and with that, everything that's going on right now in China, it's like, I don't know, man. I, 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 I would like us to kind of just almost pretend it's not happening till they get their shit together. I think that's the only way forward right now. In, you know, international betting sites taking the bets <coughs> on the games, you know, these teams being allowed to go to international tournaments with very dubious histories and pasts and associations. I think people need to take a fucking stand and say, listen, we're not going to let you treat your players like shit. We're not going to let you fix matches and just pretend none of this is happening. Like, you know, if, if Valve aren't going to do something, somebody somewhere needs to do it. Why can't it be one of these associations? What about we, sir? Is someone going to say something? You know, like, I, it can't just be me. I, I've tried to document this. You know, I, I, there's a great post on Reddit with all of my videos talking about China. It, it's, it's, a, it's a broken fucking record, man. It's, um, you know, whatever. Anyway, we can talk about some CS transfers, I guess. Um, Who's been sold down the bus today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> selling them down the bus. Well, Cloud9, Cloud evidently, because very strange we were talking Man, about i'll tell you who cloud nine is as a team right? yeah, i'll give you an analogy right i once had a relative i won't give any more deals and i don't bother my private life but i once had a relative right who was one of those people who couldn't move with the times right and understand that you know like things get cheaper and things rather things get more expensive because of inflation and stuff you know those people who are like it should cost two pounds yeah that was about 40 years ago there's no way it could like it, it you know it's not even that it's more expensive now mate like even just relatively it wouldn't cost two pounds would it so the mm. same guy right one time we tried to help him out by chucking out a load of the stuff that he was never going to use in this garage right and i'm not exaggerating all he did was we chucked it all and skipped behind and then went right job done went home and you can already tell where this is going he just went outside got it and go fuck it look at all this stuff in here in this skip and he brought it back in his house right that's what cloud nine does as a team everyone else scores you know what this flusher guy we got a lot of him three majors played what he's fucking shit now cloud nine goes fucking just found a brand new flusher in there in the skip. this is all right, all right the, yeah. the, the irony is flusher <laughs> It's flush, it looks like someone who does sleep in a skip. So, like, all I need mean to know the analogy is this. Works. Jack, I don't have a lot of questions for you, homie. I'm not going to ask, why did you do this to your team? Why did you let Stewie 2K and Tarek cock the living fuck out of you and go join your rival teams by one step of abstraction? I'm not going to ask any of those hard questions. All I'm going to ask you is this, my G. When's Drake and signing? Because I feel like he's a fucking <laughs> franchise player. You need to lock down to a 10-year contract. And as a coach, have you ever heard of Peacemaker? I feel like, can we put the <laughs> mega shit on together of all the players who shouldn't ever be able to play top four counter strike and you just pay them a top salary? So. Well, listen, Ray, so what happened was uh, there was reports that came out again over on uh, VPE Sports, uh, DK, Put a report out that they were uh, that Cloud Nine went and uh, like Golden's health problems aren't going to get fixed anytime soon. <laughs> so they were looking. <laughs> that guy for can't a catch lot. a break, can he? I know, I know. Serious, I don't know what happened to him, mate. Like he fucking how many cursed monkey I paws is he going to get through? Like, way off. Yeah, like at this point I mean? in time, I'm expecting it to like if you cut to an episode in about six months, it'd be like, yeah, oh, it's uh, it's very tragic, but we're going to have to turn the machine off now. And then all of a sudden, like his finger just twinges a little bit. Someone hands him an extra sketch. He puts "I alive." Like, <laughs> just goes too far, I mean. <laughs> I bring. I know. <laughs> I alive. <laughs> just get... Why have they got one of them before? Like... Hey, look, there's this guy on a life support machine. How can we communicate with him? Bring in the extra sketch, nurse. Like, how the fuck? Must be like iPad now. Must have upgraded. Uh, I alive. Right, well, anyway, man alive, more like, because what they fucking decided they were going to do uh, after, like, uh, Golden was kind of uh, un unlikely to be able to play at Katowice. Um, they started looking at potential replacements. And again, they didn't go down this European route that you thought they might. They started looking at, you know, unproven, untested North American talent, which, as we all know, oh, man, that's so a fucking it, hell unpolished of a North American <laughs> talent, you know. Not yeah. politically correct people, you know. Well, so they started looking uh, at a chap called Inf Infinite. Yeah. And, um, yeah, uh, within... Within moments of the announcement uh, sort of coming out, uh, other players, coaches, 
people in the scene with clout started coming out and saying, yo, this guy is fucking outrageous. Like, you don't want him in your team. You know, he's dropped all these racial epithets. I will uh, just say, in the I'm past. just going to go ahead and say this. If I was someone who'd been in the NACS score scene from 2013 to now, and I'd have just been keeping logs on Skyping and games, taking a lot of screenshots, pretty sure about half the people who I saw who were pro players who came out and t- said about how unacceptable what that guy did was, are all absolute mad hypocrites because I know the NAC scene and I know how much those words are thrown nonstop around that scene to this day. So uh, there, was a lot, there was a little bit that irked me about that, even though clearly that person... Probably should not be playing for Cloud9 in this scenario, you know. It's a tough yeah. scenario. You know, well, well, look. Oh, yeah, oh, exactly. On, on the one hand, I believe in the statute of limitations. If he was 13, I'd say fair enough, you know, but it did seem a bit yeah. decent on that one. Yeah, yeah. That's and what he I had mean, doubled it. down even until recently, until basically the Cloud9 off. He'd even sort of done that, hadn't he? Yeah. Refused to well, acknowledge it. Which, you know, there's a lesson here for any young and upcoming players. Like, you do need... From just time to time, just project yourself into the future a little bit and see where you might be and what you might be doing. Because ultimately, if you're if you're a Counter Strike player and you're playing in that middle tier and you never see yourself getting to the, to pro, what the fuck are you even doing? Like, by, you know, what are you actually doing? Like, I'll just drop end bombs and all that because you know I don't even want to go pro. Me, these things will definitely not allow you to have the career you could. I don't uh, which know about goes... that, Officer Richie. Maybe I will have a great career after dropping end bombs all over the place. <laughs> Officer <laughs> Richie. Yeah, yeah, worked out for him, didn't it, mate? Fucking old three day long pro career. Yeah, I'll back to quote in two pack is Jesus on Twitter. Sorry, it'll be in cloud nine within three months. <laughs> yeah, but, mate, the way things are going, it wouldn't even surprise me. But mate. anyway, unfortunately, what happened, guys, was they got in this guy infinite. The community kicked up a whole shitstorm, you know, at which point in time, Jack comes from League of Legends. So he took a page right out of the Riot playbook where you say, what do you mean? I was never going to recruit this infinite guy anyway. I was thinking about it, but I also entirely independently and purely coincidentally had decided not to pick him up. And now I'm picking up this other guy. Who, let me see his name. Let me just check. Lewis CK, right? Well, he should probably be okay. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, bad man. Right. Um, So, anyway, uh, I'll I'll, I'll finish up the the infinite bit. Uh, Basically, uh, completely, you know, apparently it was an 11th hour deal. Obviously, we all know that the fucking deadline was looming and that it you know it looked very much like uh you know cloud nine were having a hustle and maybe rush things you know that's all the organizations are in that boat but they moved away from infinite very very quickly infinite put out an apology you know said uh you know i'm not a racist that's not what i'm about uh you know uh it it, it was a heated moment it slipped out all, all the usual standard stuff um and I'm I'm kind of like you. I think like listen, if it, it, you know this is all recent, you've got a lot of fucking growing up to do, uh, and you've got a lot of serious thinking to do. If that's like how you want to talk to other human beings, uh, and you're definitely not in a position mentally where you could go and represent a big sports organization. But equally, some of the motherfuckers that crawled out the woodwork to shit on this guy, like I talked to the dude, but Ricks, you're having a Steffi Graf, mate. I know. You're having a Steffi Graf, aren't you? Like what the fuck is? You know what I mean, what, what is what is it with you? He's one of the most notorious toxic guys in fucking NA coming out and going, yeah, he's saying bad words and all that, isn't he? Like, <laughs> fucking have a word. You know, like, it can't be you that fucking points it out, you know? But this way, we all know John Jones is dodgy as fuck, but it's not like Jose Canseco is coming out like, hey, fucking, <laughs> he's made a mockery yeah. of the sport. I mean, yeah, exactly. He's it's, mate, if Barry Bonds had come out and pulled fucking John Jones' card, like, what would you say? You know what I mean? You'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't fucking believe it, could you? Right? So anyway... Um, you know, just saying. So Infinite got fucking pushed out the picture. Definitely a move for the best. He needs to go sit in a fucking corner and have a think. Uh, but then they move towards Zelsis, um, who, as you know, is an, another younger, more inexperienced kind of player. Never really played at this level before. Seems to have a lot of, you know, it's one of those moves where he's got a lot of good sentiment in the community. You know, I sent him, I sent him a congratulatory message that I often do to players privately. Just sent him one. Seems like a nice dude. Seems like a nice kid. Um, but uh, I, but I, but now this is <laughs> seems like a nice dude and a nice kid. But this is where we shit on the nice dude and the nice kid. On, well, no, because done. no, nothing. I'm just saying. I, I, I don't, I don't 
think this is the kind of move a team like Cloud9 should be making oh, now. And I, I, I know historically they've had a lot of luck with developing younger talent. Obviously, Street 2K is the standout for that, right? Like, you pick him up from Splice for 20k. The, the prescribed wisdom in the community was that it wasn't a good move, and who is he? And all the pros, you oh, know, all the washed-up yeah. pros were all calling him a cheater, and you know, because of how he played super aggressive and would just run through smokes and kill people. Uh, but it turned out to be not just a good move, it turned out to be probably one of the greatest pickups in in the modern era of counter strike uh i don't know if Zelzis is going to go the same way but this isn't at loggerheads with how cloud nine have, have carried their business so i'm kind of ambivalent about the move i don't want to condemn it because if i'd been one of those people that had condemned the stewie 2k move saying it was unproven i'd have had egg on my face but equally i i, I think with the caliber of names on this roster i think bringing in a a, a comparative unknown it's it's a hell uh, of a gamble, especially ahead of uh, a big tournament at the start of the year. So, what are your thoughts about this move? Oh, I, I have no qualms whatsoever about. Like I, I told you, the Stu Two K one is an example of he is the clear exception to the rule. He's a guy who got brought out of nowhere and actually turned to, out to make it at the top pro level. That's so rare; it's unbelievable. Like if you go ahead and bet against those guys, you will be wrong once or twice out of like a hundred. As opposed to, what's the other approach? Everyone else doesn't say, Rich, well, just wait and see. No, they go, no, he's going to make it. It's like, they're the ones betting on the 98 that are going to fail out of 100. And then when they get too right, going, well, I was right that time. It's like, well, what about the other 98 time? Like, what are you talking about? So I, this one's even less like the studio care one, because obviously he doesn't even have the basis to suggest he has this potential or massive skill, you know. So it doesn't look like a good move. As you alluded to, I can't really blame Cloud9. I don't really know what you're supposed to do when last minute you need someone. This is actually the problem with the whole major cycle. It lasts so long that mm. anyone who thinks they have any chance to get into the minor, then in their brain thinks, well, I wouldn't go to the minor if I didn't think I'd win it. Therefore, they won't leave and join your team. doesn't matter that they wouldn't make it out the minor. Everyone has that sort of parlay mentality of like, well, if I can make it to the minor, then I'll get out the minor and get to the major. And then we're at the major. And you know, like, Everyone, unfortunately, is so optimistic in Counter-Strike before a tournament that all the talent that should be on a list that Cloud9 could get any of the 20 players here, none of them are available. So I don't really know what you do last minute. I mean, quite frankly, for me, this major is a write-off for Cloud9 as it is. They basically just have to go, just sort of dick around, hope they can get a few results and then build on whatever they keep with the players that stay. They're not going to do anything at the major. Like, that's not going to happen. Well, sounds familiar, right? And, and uh, you know, look, I... I... It's weird. Like, how do you go from winning a fucking major in January and having this, like, le you know, legendary NA team? And then playing the next two majors with fucking <laughs> standings. Is this for yeah. real? Yeah, like, I, I don't know. It it's not to the same level yet. But it does remind me a lot of what happened with Envious, who we'll talk about in a moment, um, and, and how they just massively got disinterested. You know, they got that fucking Overwatch franchise. You know, they, they started looking at a sort of almost not thinking about success, thinking about dollars and cents, and they just let that fucking great team go to seed until they got to a point where they were like, yeah, we're not going to have a CS team. We'll come back when the time is right. Oh, look, there's some shitters, and we can get a fucking, you know, ESEA spot or whatever it was, so we'll pick them up, and now they represent Envy. You know, it's like... You've got to think bigger than that at Cloud9. I mean, Jack recently did a, you know, he put a statement out there where he said, like, Cloud9's in our DNA, uh, CS is in our DNA at Cloud9. You know, that's, we're never going to not have a team. Well, this is as good as at the moment, right? I mean, like, it's like a Theseus's ship of, of has-beens or that's unknowns. That's the part that kills me as well, Rich. And automatic. I I actually think, yeah, oh, Mike, I'll give, you've got to give him like the credit. Like, to be fair, yeah. he actually is very good. I, I mean, he, obviously, he already should be an MIBR if he wanted to be. He could have been years mm -hmm. ago. We could have seen that. But this is the part that kills me about the Cloud9 team is, as you said, it, the approach is what makes no sense. Like, if you were willing to write off a year, then you should have gone with all rookies and seen if you struck gold and one of them turned out to be good and you got them free. If you're going to go this approach, you've done it exactly wrong. Because what you've done is you've gotten players who are like, it's like if you told me each of these names separately, I'd go, yeah, he could be all right. Let's see the rest of the team. Ah, not bad. Well, I guess he maybe he could come back. Ah, he used to be good a few years ago. Who else have we got here? It's like, wait a minute, that's the whole team, except automatic. Like, if, 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 if you're starting out and you're at rock bottom again and you're having to build up your team, if you're somewhere like Cloud9, where what you have going for you is resources, you have a high salary, you can pay someone, you have an organization that if the team ever gets good, you can put everything behind them. What you need to do with a guy like, in that scenario, in my opinion, 
is get a really strong first one or two pieces and say, mm. even if I'm bad now, I'm, I'm making a statement that this team in a year is going to be a contender. So, for example, if I was Jack, I'd have been one of the people that the second I heard about that face clan stuff with Carrigan, I'm contacting that guy and I'm literally telling him, listen, I'll make you the highest paid in-game leader in the world and come join my team. You'll have a saying who's going to – like, I'd be going that approach because, I, as we see here, the sort of players you've picked up, Birds of a feather flock together. Like they're, they're all the same sort yeah. of player. They're all somebody who used to be really good two years ago is washed up now. And as a result, they're all sort of going, well, whatever, we'll all just rehabilitate our careers at once. Like when you bring like fucking some old actor, like when like when John Travolta came out back in fucking Pulp Fiction, right, and reinvented his career, the entire movie wasn't just a bunch of has beans. Like the whole point of why he was able to reinvent his career is the director was really hot at the time couple of the actors like Samuel L. Jackson are on the way up. Like everything else has to be money and then you can then be a, a rehabilitating element in it. You can't rehabilitate a whole bunch of people all at once. This is like, like fucking Cloud Nines, like Kiyoshima himself only can use, use one leg. He's trying to teach Flusher, who has the ability to use none of his legs, to look, to walk again as fucking Golden watches on from a hospital bed going in and out. Yeah, just get going, yeah, brah. <laughs> it's like, like, what is this team? What, what the fuck is it? Why, not, why not do the I Alive? Good in why, 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 why not do the I Alive callback? It was better. I don't know. Could have done. Could have done. Because he's already alive. He knows that much. Mm. Listen. It, he just wishes he was. If there's one thing I can tell you about Golden, he is definitely alive. Because how else is he going to keep stealing checks from Cloud Nine? So. <laughs> I mean, look, you know who I blame for all of this? Jesus. Skadoodles. <laughs> I don't know. Well, yeah. Skadoodle, and, yeah. And, and classic Jesus. Yeah. It's all uh, Jesus. Fault. If, if Skadoodle hadn't been the fucking Ennis Delmar of the fucking NA scene, like, it would have just been perfect. Like, if they, everybody had just had the uh, realization at the right time that it was just never going to happen and they could have just moved on from him after that fucking major, none of this is happening, mate. Then I'm going to have to ask you this, Richard. All Do right. you really blame Skadoodle then? Because here's the problem. In, in isolation, Skadoodle should absolutely do what is best for him as a person. He should try and get the best team he can play on. He should get the best job he can get. He should get the best salary he can get. He should do what he wants. Now, Skadoodle can't make Cloud9 sign him. Skadoodle can't make Cloud9 keep him on the active roster. Skadoodle can't force Stewie 2K to demand that Skadoodle stays and then say, otherwise I'll leave and then leave anyway after Skadoodle. Skadoodle can't do any of these things. He's no puppet master. He's just a dude who misses a lot of op shots. Like at the end of the day, there was a lot of enablers in that team and there was a lot of people. Sure. And I think that's a good word their for own it. responsibility, you know, when making it sound like, well, Skadoodle's chose to stay. Yeah, it doesn't mean he has to stay, you daft cunt. You can kick him out the team anytime you want you know so i'm with you a part of it's his fault but i think the the key part that the catalyst as it were was not skadoodle it was jack yeah. it was stewie 2k it was other people it was the na scene that all stood up for him i think he is good wow <laughs> leave skadoodle alone under a fucking blanket guess what you reamed out little mess i hope you end up like that guy nobody in about five years just a shit meme on the internet <laughs> whatever happened to that guy he was big for I, a while wasn't he i don't know mate. just I mean, I guess, I guess Britney got better, so maybe he just turned his life around. I don't know. One, one He's probably minute. the fucking coach of Cloud9 right now, trying to rehabilitate <laughs> Flusher, just going, come on, Flusher, work for Britney. She's got air and everything now. You might have an acceptable face. I don't know. Where do you want me to go on that one? I need to go somewhere. I kept it vaguely within bounds. Look, one minute. One minute you're fucking flossing for disin disinterested people in New York. And we're not talking about flossing like doing all that, yeah. Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Doing that? <laughs> that yeah. No. Uh, and then the next minute, you know, you're just back to fucking mediocrity. That's life. So who knows? But um yeah, listen, I I, I don't know, dude. I, I, I want someone to take the reins on the Cloud9 project because if it keeps going the way it's going. Here's where we end up. We end up going into fucking, you know, halfway through 2019. Still no decided roster uh, on on a, a Cloud9 team. Players from all disparate parts of the world. You're wasting one of the great CS talents in Automatic. You know, and this is the other question for Zelzis. I understand why you would join. You know, you go from Swole to Cloud9 every day of the week, right? Of course, yeah. But this idea that you're going to develop him as a, as a talent, who's going to develop him? Who's taking responsibility for that? What are you going to learn? You know, like think about the players you're playing with. What are the what realistically? What are they going to te teach you? 
Like Kishima's going to come in and put his arm around you and go, and this is how you isolate yourself from your own country. Brilliant. You know, he can ask Infinite for that advice. Right? Then you got fucking Flusher, and it's heh heh, and on cash it locks here, so never look in that direction when you're walking through that part of the map. You know, like, what what, what great lessons are you going to learn? These aren't, like, in-game leaders and obviously, and next to Flusher's PC, there's just a stack of whatever <laughs> mouse he uses with, like, a post-it on it, like, Flusher's mice, do not touch. Yeah, do not touch, exactly. Like, you know, like, <laughs> oh, oh, like it's not Flusher's like, mouse like, should be like that fucking nighty. <laughs> Movie version of Judge Dredd, where when you touch the gun, it adds out of your DNA. Yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it does. I'm pretty sure it does. That's like, what it's like. R- it's fucking rival sensei or whatever should be like. It? like yeah. But you know, it's like these are not players that have like a proven track record of like developing young talent. You know, they've never been in-game leaders for any long period of time in their careers. Like it's just fucking. You know this. You know I, I think yeah. When you're a young player, obviously you have to take the opportunity. But like even a great opportunity like MIBR, which I still think Stewie was right to jump at, that can turn into a fucking nightmare real fast. So the idea that you're gonna get on board this fucking train wreck Cloud Nine team and it's gonna elevate your career, you want to be careful that you're not the next fucking fuck was his name? I can't remember his fucking name. He's that irrelevant. It was that cunt who came in as in-game leader to fucking Cloud Nine oh, for like slimy. three months. Slemmy? Who wants to be the next Slemmy? And who wants that? Like, even Golden with the fucking extra sketch would be like, we can bring you back, but you have to be Slemmy. <laughs> I turn off. That would be it, mate. He'd be, he'd be fucking tapping out. Who wants that? Who wants to be Slemmy? You know, so you got to be careful what you fucking wish for, dude. I'm just saying. So, yeah, I, I think Cloud9 have got all sorts of fucking problems. Um, you know, in 2019. You know the Jack's, thing, Richard? Jack's got to get the shit together, man. Richard, think about this yeah. for a second. So they lost Stewie 2K, fair enough. You know, initially they had their problems. Who do we replace him with? Kind of the same scenario that happened to Optic when they lost Stanislaw. Law. You know, your first player is the hard one because you want to make the move initially to immediately get back to where you are, which is unrealistic, you know. But this is my problem. To this day, Jack himself will never address this and admit this. But bearing in mind, he then lost Tarek months later. Would the correct solution not have been what Thorin told you, which is get FNS, you did that, well done. Yeah. Let him start rebuilding a team. And at this point, yeah. you'd have a competent team with real players in a basic that you know you could have you could be so far ahead of where you are at this point in time. Instead, they chose to let that's why you know what I'm just saying it straight up. It's barely even a joke. Jack is literally getting cocked. He let Stuart 2K cock the fuck out of him. Ruin his own I team. love how every episode, there's always someone getting ready? cucked. But the, but the who, who's, one, whose wife's getting fucked today? Dude? The maddest one is, not only did he let Stuart 2K cook him, he let Tarek cook him and kick FNS out, who he's just bought, and then let Tarek leave as well. You don't even know what's good for you, Jack. Like, you've got to take care of your own interests, for fuck's sake. Well, it's, you, you are right. But, what are you uh, doing? Yeah, no, he, he, like I said he's got to take charge. He's got to take charge. Uh, so let's talk about a team that is trying to take charge, and let's assess their moves. Complexity. How many times have I said it on this podcast, Duncan, that it's t- time to start spending that Dallas Cowboys money? You've got this big association. You know, we all love players. That Irony, of course, being the Dallas Cowboys fucking love to spend money on players who don't deserve it. <clears throat> Dak Prescott probably going to get a massive contract soon. So anyway. Uh, ah, I, I've, got, I've got a soft spot for Prescott. In man. no universe should he get like a max contract like I guarantee he gets soon, mate. He's going to get mate. like mad money, I get, bet you. And he'll be busted in like three years. Like, there's my prediction for you. Okay. I'll, 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 st- I'll be stand getting with that. 20 million a year for it, being a busted Look. up piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Just because your boy Amari Cooper came along and fucking made him look yeah. half decent. Tony Romo was still better any day of the week than Dak Prescott has ever been in his life. Well, oh, yeah, but then, then the, play. the playoffs, the playoffs, mate. You know. Oh, I mean, yeah, Dak Prescott money in the playoffs, and he four No, no, no. But let's see, let's see what happens. Let's just see. Let's uh, anyway. let's. We'll anyway, my point was they the end of the year. Money on fucking players, no matter who they are. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Time complexity for well. Them. Well, so I was looking forward to seeing them. You know, it was very clear that they were dropping the players. They were going to start cycling in some new ones. Um, and yeah, I don't know how I feel about this at all. Uh, first of all. Ricky, uh, the Australian player, has joined Complexity. Now, this is a guy that, you know, um, he couldn't hack it in Renegades, then he couldn't hack it in Rogue. I have said it many, many times. I do not rate this player uh, at at all. 
um, as a top tier talent, uh, especially back when he was like orping and stuff. I, I think he's going to be rifling in this lineup because obviously they've got Shazam. Uh, he just took shots. Like the, the worst kind of orper is the player that tries tries to make shots that aren't in their you know locker. They they don't have the ability to make them. They're trying to be fucking guardian when they need to be more like device. You know what I mean? I fucking hate watching orpers that do that. You know, Draken is somebody that's guilty of that. They go for these outrageous shots, and it's like, right, there's a guy stood right in front of you. Can you bang him out? No. All right, brilliant. doesn't matter that you made that insane fucking flick two, two seconds ago then, does it? Because you just lost the round because you missed the sitter, you know? Um, and R Ricky used to frustrate me like that a lot. Uh, I think he needed to simplify his game. Let's put it that way. Um, now he joins complexity. I don't know if you're getting anything better here. I don't know. Like, if you're replacing Android and, and Ye with a player that's fucking crapped out of Renegades and crapped out of Rogue, I don't even know if you can call this an upgrade. And then the other uh, news that came out was they're going way back in time. Because uh, now nothing, um, who we, we know that even though he retired, it was very clear that nothing was wanting to still play. Uh, he was the guy that used to get angry in all of those old guys club games. You know, he was the one that wanted to win all of the matches. Oh, he, was you, the one he couldn't quite have it. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, <laughs> and look, listen, I always thought, mate, I, I always thought uh, when he announced his retirement, it was almost like a way to sort of just, you know, get away from, from Cloud9 and, and do some stand-in work and, and, until he could maybe join the team, um, you know, permanently. And he, he did show himself to still... Maybe not have what it takes to be at the very top of the top tier, but he could still hang in there when he was that stand-in from our sports. I, I, I thought he acquitted himself pretty well for somebody that had been out of the game for a while. Now, he's going to be the stand-in for Complexity at Katowice, replacing one of the young guns. So i got to ask you, uh, how do you assess these moves? This, of course, makes the team Shazam, Death, Stanislaw, Ricky, and nothing. Is this a step in the right direction, or is this regressive? As a one-off, if they can, um, like, I could see nothing being okay as a one-off. Like, coming in, guy who's a veteran, has played in many different types of lineups, obviously likes to play a fairly loose style of game anyway, if you know him as a person. I could see him being fine. I think Ricky will be okay in the context of who they had before. Which is I one thing I never bought about complexity was the firepower. Like I think a lot of those players overperformed at the beginning of the last major, and they've basically lived off that hype ever since. When I've watched them at all the tournaments since, it's been mad underwhelming. And I've been actually really yeah. disappointed about how bad they've been at some of these tournaments. Where I'm not even talking about good teams they're losing to; they've lost to nobodies. Like teams that oh, sure. barely have ever even watched this year. So they were definitely like not a very good team. I agree with you though. The angle that I don't get about this these moves is. These aren't the blockbuster moves that are the obvious next move. Like the next move is secure a Tarek. It is try yeah. and make a play for like a fucking Carrigan if you can. I mean, that's probably above you. What's and, reasonable. And didn't, you didn't, Jason, didn't Jason Lake say that they had talks with Tarek and couldn't yes. work it out? I believe he put a tweet out saying Which obviously that. in the context that nothing is standing in is interesting because maybe it implies it's going to happen after the major. Okay, possibly. Yeah. But yeah, I'm with you on that one again. Like, first of all, I, the part that I hate the most about this move is the idea that you're doing it for the major. Like, mm. so you believed in that last lineup all the way up till now that you're going to cut them off right before the tournament, which would have made a logical end to your time with them. Or you know that they're shit, in which case, why didn't you act on this three months ago? Like, why are you going to a major without... I'll ask this of anyone. Why are you ever going to majors without a real lineup that you anticipate either was a team you currently think is acceptable, you're willing to ride it out to the end, or it's your next lineup? You shouldn't be going to majors with standings. It's, it's just stupidity as far as I'm concerned. So I don't know how they misplayed that, but that's clearly a misplay. In the context of who they could mm. have picked, these are okay choices. I don't necessarily hate them, but I don't think they're going to do a lot as a team. It's very strange, isn't it, that the, the last couple of majors, it feels like, have been almost like testing grounds for new lineups. When, of course, it should be the opposite, right? It should be the place where, you know, even if it's only three months build up, you've refined a team and you take that team to the major to try and it's win like the world I championship. Say, I would logically make it so that, like, if you really thought the lineup that you had until these recent moves was good two months ago, well, then you should have told them the major's the last chance you have. So at the end of the major, we'll, we'll reevaluate, then we'll decide what the next lineup is. Why you would then kick people just before a major? If anything, you give yourself less chance, surely. Surely the old lineup would have a better chance than. Bunch of fucking mixed players now coming in without proper tournaments beforehand. 
Yeah. It, it's it's strange. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, I I will say this. I I expect this team to kind of just be on a par with what they were getting. And what was interesting was I I think it was Yay that that put out a twit longer. You know, the players curse, right? They got to put out the twit longer. I don't mind the transparency, but <clears throat> what I hate is the way the community sees upon a twit longer, and it's either really overly emotional and it's always against the player's interest, or. Uh, it's like it, it gets presented as objective truth when, of course, it couldn't be any more subjective because it's one it's one person's take on what happened. But he did say that, like, practice, uh, the attitude towards practice had kind of fallen off and people weren't trying as hard after the major uh, where they had that run and they got all the plaudits. And that's a pitfall of a lot of teams, you know. You go to a big tournament, you punch above your weight, and everyone starts sucking you off and saying how fucking great you are. And then you think, all right, well... We're a successful team now. We don't actually have to try hard. Well, the the reality is that's when you have to try even harder than you ever have because now you're on every motherfucker's radar. People are going to watch your demos. People are going to prep for you. No longer are you, oh, them shit is from NA. We'll just bang them out, right? We'll we'll concentrate on our game. Now you're worthy of prepping for. So that's when you have to take your shit to the next level. So if that is true, then complexity have done themselves over a little bit. But I just think with the caliber of players they're getting, I think nothing might add something. I I, I think nothing still has something to give a team. I would have liked to have seen nothing in with the youngsters, though. Not some bust-up motherfucker like Ricky, you know? Like, he's no spring chicken. And I, I think I think we can say that a lot of those Australian players in Renegades, I think we all know they don't hack it at the top of NA, let alone the top of the Tier 1. That's just a reality. So it's going to be interesting, but I, I think complexity at this you know major they're going to be just as par for the course. Like it doesn't matter what roster they would have took, they're going to f- do poorly. I think, uh, but at least they're spending the money, and that represents a change in culture at, sure. at, at the organization. And by the way, if start. you think of the context of this conversation. Tell you what, bearing in mind, unless Cloud9 wants to go all European, they're going to have to completely revamp their squad anyway in the coming years. Complexity, if they make the right moves in the next three to four months, can make Cloud9 the fucking fourth best NA org. Like, they can literally put more space between them and the top and actually, like, leverage some quality pieces to their own team, potentially. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Now, we've already done a dark joke about uh, a player begging for death on his deathbed rather than come b- coming back and, and experiencing a fate worse than death, which in that joke was being Slemmy. Of course, these are just jokes. We really like Slemmy on the show. Good lads. Uh, terrible player. But, you know, that's the way it goes. Uh, but there is somebody that has entered a fresher hell than anything I can imagine. <laughs> oh, well, you know who it is. Oh, boy. Is this Refresh? No, 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 no. Carrigan. It's worse than that. Oh, Carrigan, yeah, yes. he definitely is worse than that. I don't know. Right, I'm gonna do some theorizing here. So this is the news that Carrigan has been loaned out to Envious. Uh, this is the Envious team with Drone, Nifty, JDM, and Cutler. Right, Carrigan has gone from. You know, imagine just looking over. Like it's you know you're there in Phage. You know no matter how bad things get, you look over. You see Nico. You see Olaf Meister. You see Rain. You see Guardian. You think fucking hell. Look at the boys I'm playing with. And then, just like fucking vanilla sky, you just open your eyes one minute, look around, you've got Cutler on your right. What is fucking going on? This is a fucking horror show. And I'm going to theorize here that, um, basically, they that FaZe didn't want Carrigan to go to one of their rivals, one of the major teams, potentially build a better team, get them in better shape. Because, as you've said many fucking times, dude, it's counterproductive. It's massively counterproductive. Of course, for FaZe, it doesn't make any sense to let him do that. Yeah. So FaZe, obviously, no envious from the good old glory days of Call of Duty and Kitty Casinos and all of that. So they're going to basically, I think what happened here is they reached out and said, listen, you know, we're pretty bad, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll keep Carrigan warm for you until you sell him for some exorbitant buyout fee. I mean, that's my theory about what happened here. Just in terms of the move, uh, I mean, obviously, Envious are getting a great deal. Let's be clear with that. But I think this is possibly, uh, for Carrigan, I think it would have made more sense if he didn't join a team than join this team. I honestly think he would have been better off. Because no good can come of this. 
There's oh, no I'm way. Rich. Even I'm... Carrigan can't do something with this roster, you know? I'm with you on the angle that if, for example, this team goes to the major, just gets absolutely shit on, looks terrible, there will be some people in the community who think, ah, fuck this Carrigan guy, he's garbage. Exactly, exactly. But at the same time, I think just from his own perspective, like all these months he was in phase where he wasn't the in-game leader, that doesn't feel like you're properly playing if you're Carrigan. Because you know in your career you're supposed to be an in-game leader. So you're waiting for your next chance to get going. So even though I agree with you, I don't think there's that much opportunity to really do anything with this team. I think to Carrigan, it's just a chance to be busy again, a chance to feel like you're a in-game leader, you've got something to work with, a new challenge, you know. I agree with you. It's probably naive to think that's going to work, but... I think for, for players and in-game leaders, they need to have something like that to work on. So I think for him, he was just going stir crazy, just sat around doing fuck all. So even though, yeah, I don't think this is in any way like a final destination. Well, it might be final destination. For <laughs> yeah, it might be like team. the fucking movie, man. Yeah. But yeah. In, as in where he'll actually end up, no, this will be the one tournament he plays for that squad. And even because the big problem is, even if you think of the best case scenario, like the best case scenario is just qualify for the major. Let's be real, that's it. Going yeah. beyond that, I mean, it's just not going to happen, is it? Like, I know last major there was enough ridiculous shit you can't say never, but, like, put it this way, it shouldn't. There's no reason you should be able to do anything with this lineup of players. And I, uh, also, I just want to add as well, I thought this was interesting. Um, there was, like, uh, strong legs. You remember the, the uh, I don't want to say disgraced commentator. That's a bit too strong. But, you know, he was, you know who I'm talking about. And he he put a tweet out that said, uh, damn, they just going to hit Pollo or Polo, however you fucking say it. It should be Pollo, in my opinion, the chicken, the Hispanic chicken. Uh, they, they just, not, not Pollo with the word. Uh, they just going to hit Pollo with the thanks for ringing for two, three months feels bad, man. And he replied to that with a smiley face. Now, let's just be fucking real about this player, right? First of all, uh, he's terrible. Uh, re real talk. He's played with some of the best in-game leaders. He's played with Daze. He's played with Steel. I, he, I've not seen any development from this motherfucker at all at any point in his career. Um, so the idea that, like, Envious should ever have an opportunity, like, oh, we can go get Carrigan, you know? Oh, yeah, well, we've we'll, we'll, we got to somehow... Work. No, you, you cut him all fucking day. Like, what's... It's not even a discussion. And then the idea that he's going to put out the little smiley face as if to say, yep, they did, and they did me wrong. Grow the fuck up, mate. What planet are you living in where you think you should be immune to a pickup like Carrigan coming to your rock. Like, holy fucking shit. Like, I'd just be thinking, well, at least it wasn't some shit that fucking got me off the team. You know, some guy I've got no respect for, some guy that's a cheap <coughs> nothing. It's only one of the fuck. It took one of the legendary in-game leaders we have Counter-Strike to dislodge me from this fucking roster. Like, I have a bit of fucking humility. I know it doesn't come natural to fucking NACS players, but holy fucking shit. Think about the approach even his fucking mate was taking. His mate didn't say Polo was way better than some of the players in current Envious and should be there instead of him. He's just gone. Wow. So you let a guy play for your team for a few months and now you don't sign him? Yeah, mm. what's, the what's the problem, mate? It was a trial. It didn't work out. No, it's no, but, business. You, but, but you let him play for three months and then didn't sign him. Yeah, you're having a real hard time getting this through your mind, aren't you? Like, I never promised to sign him. I was never obliged to sign him. It's not a fucking, like, it's not like he was applying to join a fucking orphanage. Like, this is a pro player's teammate. Like, we're actually trying to keep good people around. Like, if he's not good enough, it sounds like the end of his trial would be, mm, let me just check, the perfect time to fucking cut him. And then also, yeah, as you say, Rich, him himself replying with a little smiley face you may as well have just photoshopped your own face into that meme of like the crying guy with the fucking mask shoved over his face but your own crying face with a mask of a smiley put over there that's oh really i know right yeah now. like yeah you yeah. aren't doing shit with your passive aggressive little smileys you know take yeah. your fucking emoji and sling your fucking hook along with your best pal who doesn't even know how to argue even your own pal won't say you're good enough said Case closed. <laughs> I didn't see him making a fuck. Why? He, tell you what, why don't you make your own fucking North American CSGO organization <laughs> and hire Polo to it and then make your own major if you don't like it? it it's it's so fucking crazy. Like, I, I, honestly, I mean, if I'd seen anything from that guy, I'd be like sat here going, well, you know, maybe he's been playing well and there's certainly people on the roster. I, maybe I would cut. Nah, fuck off. You, 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 it was never a permanent fucking move. And now Envious have the chance to get one of the fucking great in-game leaders to, like, at least try and get them to the fucking major? Sling your fucking hook, mate. It's not a charity. 
Uh, one of the things that Monte Cristo talked about, you know, I don't really, um, I, I keep my hand in on the Overwatch stuff, ma- mainly for the just hilarious uh, fucking pornography that the fan base makes for themselves because they're all fucking dysfunctional, you know? Yeah. I, I posted some in the chat, actually, the toes. I think uh, if you want to have a look at that, just fucking Widowmaker <laughs> sucking Trace's toes because the... I don't know what's wrong with Overwatch fans, but, you know, that's... That's that's we can talk about that later. But Monte Cristo brought up a point. You know, I've said it myself many times. This is meant to be pro fucking sports. It's not a fucking anime. It's not an anime. The power of friendship will only solve so much. You know, you don't put all the rings together at the end and yeah, and fucking win the tournament. Some people just aren't good enough. Some teams just aren't good enough. Some relationships don't fucking work out. You know, it's it's ridiculous and. Again, it's like this idea that you're somehow beholden to try and make that work. That's what's done for complexity. That's what's done for fucking Cloud9. That you know, there's a common theme with all these teams we're talking about. Is that they always think, ah, I can develop the young talent and won't that be a great story? Or yeah, bloody hell, Skadoodles had his first good game in fucking six months, so maybe now we turn the corner and he finds consistency. These things aren't gonna happen. It, it's not. It, you know, not every fucking story has this unbelievable happy ending that's completely beyond the odds. That's why they're so rare. That's why they stand out. You've got to be realistic. So, yeah, just this fucking... I, I just couldn't believe that. I thought the fucking hubris of that to even tweet a little smiley face. Like, yep, yeah, they did me dirty. You you do the whole scene dirty, mate. Step up your fucking game. Or fuck off. I can't be bothered with that. Um, Optic. They made a roster move. You made a video about it. Uh, Refresh has joined. So we, we said, once that Fragsters team started breaking apart, where would the parts go? Refresh was the guy that was poised to go to the next level. I think he was the standout star on the Fragsters team. I don't think anyone uh, would disagree with that assessment. You know, players like Get Right said, this guy's going to be great. Uh, he went and stood in for Cloud9 like everyone else does these days. Uh, at the blast and he played really fucking well um and now he's got his move to optic now what's interesting here is i think a lot of people were surprised with the player that went out and also a lot of people were surprised that snappy kept on to his job and it wasn't carrigan going to optic again i don't think that wasn't because optic didn't try and get carrigan or want picking up the phone i think that's because phase like there's no fucking way there's just no way like because it, it, it it's not in our interest so Snappy rides again, uh, but Nick, it was it was Nico, the the bad Nico or the worst Nico that left. I thought he'd been doing kind of all right, and like maybe it's Yugi that I would have thought about getting rid of, and maybe moving Cage and B back to being a primary opera. Or you know, I, I I don't think Yugi's done enough lately to justify being on a top team at all, uh, which is a shame because his development really stalled after Heroic. But yeah, it was Nico who went out. I thought Nico statistically had played pretty well within a clearly dysfunctional team. Um, obviously, you can't cut Cajun. Um, I don't think he should be as immune as he is. Uh, you definitely can't cut Config. He's the star of the team. So it's, it was just an interesting move. Uh, but Refresh comes in. This is the next step for him. Does this help Optic? Uh, or, or is this like for like? Did they need one other piece in the jigsaw? What do you think happens with this Danish team? Like, I, I do think it's a like-for-like like trade because when Nico was in the North team that won DreamHack, he was pretty much like a hard entry in that team. So, like, mm. I think Refresh is brought in to do that role, and that is the role he did in Fragsters. So I would say this. Like, I'm not super high up on the guy. I think it's a mild upgrade. But as a result, that's why I don't really see it as that great a move. Like, I think it's not a bad move. Like, in isolation, it's the right one. It's just it doesn't address, as you, were, you kind of alluded to, that any of the major problems in the team. It doesn't, like, transform the team. It's not going to make them way better overnight. Also, it just leads to questions, like, as you also alluded to, like, why Nico? Like, what, what did this mm. guy do? I mean, I'm going to have to assume it was either something personal, like they didn't like the cut of his jib, or the other angle, if I have to like go in game, is when I watched them play at CS Summit and at Star Series, like two tournaments where they were playing with these players, like I was actually very puzzled by the fact that like they used to actually have config just going first on a whole bunch of T rounds. Like I thought yeah. the whole point of bringing in Nico, if he's just been in North, he's just played as a hard entry, would be like, right. You're the hard entry. Nico follow config follows behind you. That's how you farm config up. That's how you get config all the kills. That's how you set someone like config up to be the star of the game. No, in their team, it was like almost as though they were like separate players. They just went in separately. Config goes in by himself. So 
if anything, they weren't making use of Nico as it is. So if they feel more comfortable refresh for this reason, I could see a logic to it. But yeah, my biggest issue on it is it's not that big. Of, it's not a blockbuster trade. It's not one that can turn around your franchise. And Optic has so many problems that aren't about Nico or refresh that like, okay, in isolation, not bad, but I don't really see sort of, like put it this way, if Optic gets to this next major, they're not going to do fucking anything. I, I'll just go ahead and say that now. Yeah, I mean, it's one of these things, like, again, like, similar to what we talked about earlier with what are you going to learn? Like, I, I look, I think this fucking snappy mythology, you know, heroics ancient history now in, in Counter-Strike terms, in esports terms. Like, any stock he had, it, it's plummeted. It's like Activision Blizzard. You know, it's just fucking on the downward trajectory. He can't even get anything out of, like, a blockbuster pairing like Config and Cajun B. Right, he, Yugi has gone to shit. You know, so what are we talking about here when we talk about in-game leaders and what they bring to the team? Oh, if you're not way, individually developing he, players and using them correctly, Nico actually was Snappy's boy when they were in heroic. Yeah. So, so yeah. how are you not able to use your own player properly? Yeah, but this is what I mean. Yugi and N Nico obviously holdovers from that heroic roster. Exactly. And 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 he took him in and, and got two better players coming in. And couldn't do anything with it. You know, when you look back historically and you look at that heroic roster, it was almost like it was a group of friends having their, like, honeymoon moment, you know, when they had those, like, decent results. And they were never that decent. They were never that decent. And then off the back of that and community hype, he's been able to fucking get into uh, Optic Gaming, this, like, legendary esports organization and it's been really poor it, it, like the return has been really really bad config's not playing well cajun's not playing well yugi's playing terribly Th they don't have any direction they don't have any like tactical structure and if they do it's not apparent when they try to execute it so and then statistically one of the better players on the team gets traded out for a player who you know best will in the world i think he's going to be great but you got to say it's it's unproven at this point right so Weird, weird direction. I, I will say this, though. It does make me wonder, because of the fucking cahoots we know with all these Call of Duty people, like, you know, swimming in. I think what happened was Optic picked up the phone and said, I, you know, Hex is there. Yo, i got to get this snappy motherfucker off my roster. Like, he's got to go. Like, I thought he was a good in-game leader. I got duped. I should have listened to buy the numbers. Now I know better, right? And and FaZe have said, well, you know, listen, we can, we'd can we give you Carrigan, but we definitely can't give him you in time for the major. There's no fucking way, because with the players that he's got there, he could potentially create a rival team, especially because, you know, there's an unknown quantity about who FaZe is going to be using. So absolutely not. And then Envious were like, uh, uh, can I get involved? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they went, all right, Hastro, pipe down, mate. The big boys had the conversation, and basically you end up with Carrigan going to Envious for one fucking tournament to the minor, because they're not going to do anything, and then Carrigan's going to jump to Optic after the major. That's I also what I suspected, because the other thing as well is, this move, like I say, is just not that crazy a move. So to me, it looks like a move that is making the team even more favourable for someone like Carrigan to be like, hey, Carrigan, we've literally got all the pieces you need, mate. Here's yep. the keys, in you come. Because for people who don't realize, yes, Optic sounds like a massive step down to phase, but if you actually have this Optic lineup and you just replace Carrigan for Snappy, I reckon he could start fucking going to work tomorrow. This lineup could already be competent. Yeah, I definitely agree. And, and look, there's a lot of similarities. Not, not massively, but again, if you think about structurally what, uh, you know, what, is, what Astralis or then TSM, you know, that or, or question mark, uh, everyone thought they were going to be going to Team Secret. You know what they had? You know, they, they had a coach in place. I and mean, like Rugger's there. I think he's a very good coach. We've talked about it before. I think he's very, very competent. I think he does a lot of work. Uh, he was historically a, an in-game leader and presided over some uh, relatively successful Danish teams going back to source. Um, I, so I think I'm not, I'm not saying he can ever be Zonic, who I think is an exceptional coach, one of the best coaches I've ever seen, probably in any esport ever in terms of what he gives to a team. But I think Rugger definitely can give you something if you have a good in-game leader that can utilize all of the analysis and the notes and everything else that he's bringing. Then, as you said, you've got a star player who has really stalled and plateaued, right? Carrigan's tailor-made to fucking lift Config up out of the fucking mire. How many careers has fucking Carrigan resurrected? fucking you know he, he's like fucking jesus out there straight resurrecting motherfuckers he, so he, he can do it for config someone as good as config i think cajun b's in that kind of like 
he needs to feel it when he's in a team. He needs to have like shit going on, be confident in his players, have a good in-game leader. You know what like I just realized as well? That's why yeah. it, we're definitely right, Rich. I've put all the pieces together. Obviously, this move was set up to make it more attractive for Carrigan to come join Optic because he now has a clause in all future contracts that he'll never play with any players called Nico. Just to be safe. <laughs> yeah, just to be safe, because you don't want to get into a fucking gangbang with Nico. No, you don't want to get into it. any kind of a gang with Nico. <laughs> no, or any not. other type. Yeah, but yeah, none of that. But, you know, and, and obviously having, like, Refresh there, I mean, like, I'm sure he's been on Carrigan's radar. I think all of this basically reeks of, like, there is one more move coming. It's got to be snappy that goes. It's got to be. There's no, there's nowhere else to move on the roster right now because you're not going to get any of the other top Danes. And if people like KD and it are supposedly carrying enough currency to end up at uh, fucking teams like North, you definitely want to hold on to the players you've got. But I, I, I think Snappy for Carrigan is a given. I think, I think it happens, you know, straight after the major, basically. And I think Optic will be a lot better for it. But um, I just hope. In the short term, players like Refresh and all that don't get fucking chewed up by this, you know, nightmare uh, that they're in. Now, let's talk about FaZe, because we've gone from Carrigan potentially going to Optic. He is in MBS. We're just theory crafting. We don't know anything, but it makes sense to me on paper. Now, the one that's being talked about, of course, was Adrian from Gambit, not the Team Liquid coach, Adrian. A competent. Uh, <laughs> yeah, who is going to be uh, FaZe's fifth supposedly now it hasn't been officially confirmed yet but it has been reported by the usual sources that it's true including uh dk and nell I, I i believe um nell tweeted out that they were even thinking about who is it they said oh yeah pronax yes he implied yeah, uh, if you remember yeah he said, for everyone who forgets he said that they'd already been practicing with adren he could confirm to which mm. rin said you can't confirm shit or <laughs> yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah you can't confirm shit, but They were also even pl like considering Pronax brackets. Yes, Pronax. Don't know why Nell's yeah. getting snippy. I mean, just report the fucking news. Don't let it all realized in it, you know, but okay. But uh, look, but but I will I will say this. Uh, I like I don't buy that for a fucking second. I respect all of the players in phase. Oh, somebody's gone. Be back, it, army, oh, yeah, is it? It's the classic Discord. The classic. Discord the classic two, we, we've been going for two hours, have we? Classic to uh, yeah, yeah, it's all right. Um, but listen, I, I I respect all of the players on uh, phase that they know Counter Strike. You know, I don't think Nico's going to be a great in game leader, but I respect his knowledge of the game and his knowledge of players. There's no fucking way on God's green earth any of them will fucking sat around going, you know what this team needs? Some washed up in game leader who literally can't hit the fucking side of a bus that people are at the been sold to the back of. There's no fucking way. There's no way Pronax was ever in this mix. Like, I don't know if he got some bad intel or something, but I just do not fucking believe that ever. Ever, ever, ever. Now, Adrian is an interesting one. If it is true and it is going to be confirmed, and I think seized with his beautiful skin and radiant face was streaming, um, going, hey, hey, guys, remember when I could actually play this fucking game? Uh, and I think he confirmed that Adrian has been put on there. And roster. then obviously just getting calls all the time. He's going, no, Jack, no, I said no. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah. Um, Polo, now I don't want to start a team, mate. <laughs> Fucking hell, someone unplug these things, will you? Nico, I'm no, not... I'm not interested in group sex, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Infinite for the last time. So C said uh, that, that it was happening, so let's assume it is. Um, what do you think of this move? I, I, like, It's not razzle-dazzle. It's not the fucking... It's not like a big star move. It's not the power play where they get simple from Na'Vi. But with the time that they had, and with all those teams going to the major anyway, it was never going to be. In terms of a player that can fit into FaZe's system, give them what they need, and can do a deal in time for the major that isn't going to break the bank, this is probably about as good as it could have got, right? I think this is, yeah, like bearing in mind, I think about the episode where we were talking about Carrigan's like inevitably going to be going out the team, etc., it was almost impossible to figure out a player they could recruit. I mean, the best case scenario, as you say, is just get a simple or something like that and hope you shoot everyone in the head. Like, actually, of the moves that they've gone for, if you're going to have to gamble on someone who hasn't been very good in 2018 but has the legacy and the tenure to suggest they could be a good player again and is available, 
actually fucking Adren's pretty good. Like if I'm making a short list, he's going to be on the list. Like mm. this is someone I could trust to rehabilitate their game, especially surrounded by that many great players. And if you go to the beginning of CSGO, if anything, played as a supportive type of a player around star players anyway. So actually, I think of all the players you could pick, I, I kind of like this move. I don't think it make, it's the final move. Like I still think eventually mm. one day you have to address the in-game leader aspect. But as a stopgap move, I kind of like it. Yeah, I, I, I think what, what I'm seeing here as well is, like, just in terms of personality archetypes in, in the team, you know, you're absolutely right. Like, Adrian, he can he can take the lead when he needs to, you know, or, or he can take the back seat when he needs to. Like, when Zeus was on Gambit, you know, we all know how Zeus is, right? So, um, he is somebody that just doesn't get affected by big personalities, and... It kind of reminds me of, you see this a lot, right? Like, you know, historically when, like, R Reginald used to play in, like, League of Legends, he basically built a team of, like, four beta personality types around him because he was he, he wanted to be the fucking alpha. He wanted to be the man. Well, Adrian is never, you know, he just doesn't, he just doesn't get ruffled by people, you know? And, like, Nico obviously is famously a hot-headed player. Everyone else on that team is pretty much notoriously cool, calm, collected, you know, you think Rain, you think Guardian, you think Olaf Meister. I mean, Olaf Meister after Nico is probably about as fiery as it gets, and he's certainly not like on a crims level. I can't think of a time where Olaf's punched a fucking table through or anything like that. You know, so I think in terms of the personality structure there, I think he's a very good fit. Um, and I think if Nico is going to continue with in-game leading, which certainly that's what's been intimated, they the reports haven't said, oh, Adrian's going to come in and lead the team, which I think he could do and probably would do a better job than, than Nico, honestly. Um, I've always thought Adrian is the good stealth in-game leader of the CIS scene that no one ever talks about. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think, it, you know, it's well known that in all of the teams he's played in, he's involved in, like, mid-round calls and stuff like this. It's not like he's ever entirely hands-off. Uh, which is how you end up with situations like Dozier being an in-game leader, for example. But yeah, I think this is pretty good. I, I, you know, as I said, it's not it's not going to blow the phase fans away. I think this could work. I honestly think this could work. And if Adrian can even get to like seventy five percent of where he was at when he was one of the players of uh, you know first half of this uh, uh, this uh, sorry last year, um, then I think phase could be like low key ones to watch now this move isn't going to make them uh top of astralis i think we're gonna have to wait a while for that i think teams need to start getting their shit in order if we won't see that at the major um we'll, we'll see it in the moves that happen after the major one of the teams that will emerge from that will be the team that beat you know top of astralis in 2019 also let's be real like i mean i'll say this right now i think it's legit to say just like when um SK for the E-League Major Boston had to go with Phelps and they were all super mm. down on it. Like, oh, we have no chance yeah. now. It's like, of course you do. Look at the fucking players you've got. Like, we're on about a one tournament deal. You could trip over and have a great tournament and someone play amazing. And with that level of talent, it's the same thing for FaZe Clan. Unlike all these other teams we were talking about that are taking like incomplete lineups to the Major. FaZe Clan still got the talent where uh, this is not a, anything outrageous. They're as fucking amazing dark horse to win this Major. Even without an in-game leader, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, definitely an outside bet. Um, so obviously, Adrian left Gambit. I, I got to say, Gambit did it. They, they keep doing all these roster announcements, right? And I'm they, sure, they, Richard, unless I'm mistaken, yeah. was it yeah. not announced earlier yes. last year, like towards the end of last year, that like they were just going to kill the entire squad or yeah. sell the team or something? And yet now they're bringing Again. in new players. I say new players, <laughs> bonding, but you know. Yeah, yeah, not 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 literally. Uh, but yeah, they they did an announcement saying we're going to disband the team. I don't know what mad power play they were doing because ever since then they've just tried to go on as business as usual. Like they put it, they put announcements out saying. Um, Oh, look, Hobbit's available now. Well, yeah, you said you're disbanding the team. I mean, is you know, it's not available? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not indentured servitude, right? Like, you know, you these guys can fucking be approached anyway, whether you've got a team or not. So obviously he's available. And they announced Adrian was like, it's really, really weird. And then they're still picking up players and not only picking up players, right? Like if you were winding down a team, just, you know, Honor all your obligations, and then when the contracts expire, get rid of them all. But instead, they're changing players. So they put uh, Dimasik on the bench, and they brought Bondic in. Um, and I, I, I like the move. 
But it's just weird. Like, it's just weird what they're doing, you know? They've still got accomplished players on this roster, but just with this weird, like, nah, we're just going through the fucking motions kind of attitude, uh, very lackadaisical. You know, keep in mind, they got Blade as a coach, which we all thought would be straight fire, but he hasn't even had a stable roster to work with. They still got Dozier. I mean, you know, I'm ambivalent about that. It, but look, if I was running a CIS team, I'd have fucking Dozier on my team just for meme ability. Like, you know, why you, not, right? Yeah, why not? I'd right? just be filming him 24 hours a day. Oh, either. mate, the Dozier reality show would be fucking happening right oh, fucking now. that's not a thing I don't even know. No, I know. And the thing is, he, he wouldn't even notice he's too dumb. So it'd be, be fine. Like, oh, is, uh, is, is these cameras? No, no, no. Just no, do your no, thing. No, no. Yeah, when the yeah. red light's on, it's off. Don't worry about that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It, it, it'd be I'll fine. Take a shit then. Like, <laughs> <the same thing. laughs> now, now, if you'll excuse me, I'm off to the toilet. Yeah, but like, you, you know what I mean? It's just like. <laughs> He's just ridiculous. He's ridiculous. But I would have him. I would have him for marketing props, right? That's how it goes. Me, remember that? Remember that guy? We were all talking about how good he was, you know, back in the Vegas Squadron days. Well, he's stuck on this fucking shit gambit team that's going to do nothing now. Ridiculous. So I don't understand what they're doing. But let, let's talk about them like they're a real team, and in principle, are going to do things. Obviously, they're going to be playing at the CIS minor. Um. So, uh, Gambit better off with Bondic in place of Dimasic, and I mean, they considering they've won a major, they got to be right up there to take the fucking CIS minor, right? Yeah, you would figure that they should be the team. Like the CIS minor at this point in time has pretty bad teams in it, so yeah, I would assume they should win it. Risky, but... risky business saying that, Duncan. That's well, your would... Twitter fucked for for a day or two. Don't really give a fuck, mate. If I see him <laughs> tweeting Russian, just ignore it, don't I, like usual? I agree with you. The part that's bizarre about this team is I want to yeah. talk about them as all like, well, it's, you know, it's the last rodeo for some of these players. But if you have Blade as a coach and you are recruiting players, in theory, you're putting in the effort. You're trying to make it a good team. I assume Blade's working with the players, trying to find a system that works for them, trying to put them in different roles. That's probably one of the reasons why he's brought Bondic in now. Bondic used to be his boy from Flipside, obviously. Oh, Bondic, by the way, was at his absolute best as a player in Flipside as well. So I could even see that being a good angle. The problem is, like, the, as a team, they have no future, like, long term. Like, they're not going to become a top yeah. team. But yeah, I agree with you. No reason they can't win the CIS minor. There's enough players on the team still that you could do some upsets in the major. You shouldn't necessarily have to be terrible. Just you're not going to be any sort of consistent team. And there's not really any, like, if anything, you are just downgrading parts in the team. So it's tough to see how you're going to go beyond that. Like, I actually think, if anything, they've got a steal by getting bonded. I thought he would go to a better team than this, but I'm going to assume a mixture of not having many opportunities at the moment and then the fact that he's got the blade connection is why he's taking this angle. So probably good for Gambit, if anything. Um, and then just one last uh, bit of uh, roster moves as everyone's scrambling, trying to get their rosters locked. Uh, and this is... Uh, it's a bit of a come down, isn't it? Um the X Space Soldiers team that still haven't found uh, another sponsor yet. Um, well, they obviously have to replace Antares, who we talked about last episode. He's gone a big, their star player, their best player. So they brought in Yam. Yeah. Is there something about being on Renegades that means you just like, it's like if you're willing to put up with a year of being on Renegades, you then gain a lifetime supply of stolen checks from other companies in the esports industry. What the fuck's going on? Like, the even the Renegades team was shit. And y'all are taking the rejects of the Renegades team. What it, the fuck's it, it, going on now? It's crazy. I think it might be like As one the of those... C Why has the CSGO scene become some sort... Of, the CSGO scene for teams attending the major cycle become some sort of fucked up back end of a human centipede that Renegades is the front part of? Why is that the fucking... The fucking food chain? Is that when Renegades is done, you uh... recruit that cunt to your main squad and bet Who's your whole future on him? At Who's this point, the I'm surprised... Fish? I'm surprised Face Clan isn't taking fucking havoc as the next offer to the major or something. <laughs> what um, is this? But, but so to be fair, before we before we have a meme, um, obviously uh, I, I believe Yam does have Turkish roots, so I think it might be a linguistic thing. Obviously, you know we we know famously that these players obviously do all talk in Turkish, um, so that that's obviously a factor. But still, man alive, it's a 
it, it's yeah. it's such a climb down from having a player like Santares on your roster to having a sort of pick up a guy like Yam. There's no real upside. Like Yam's fucking thirty years old. You know he. He, he's he's sort of been like the twilight of his career anyway. So the idea he's going to like rock up and do anything incredible for the uh, ex space soldiers lineup in the European minor. It's like uh, the Zantares move just sort of couldn't come at a worse time for them, and there just wasn't anybody out there that they could get to replace. <laughs> you know his alias as well isn't just Yam. Like it, I think his alias that was short. It was like Yaman or something. And every right. time I ever saw that back in the day, it was just reminded. It sounded like it's some cunt you meet outside the bus station in Dallas. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. Hey, hey, your mom. Mom. hey, yeah, your mum. Hey, your mum. Get your fucking pound. <laughs> I'm trying to get. Listen, I'm trying to get to Australia to play for Renegades, but I bought a child's ticket and they won't let me on. So can I join your team for the match? Hang on, I've given you the wrong image here, Sam. But like, I do. I, one of the things that I do love about the ex-space soldiers is this one: is uh, is their coach fucking hard style. I fucking love him, man. He's like the fucking. He's a little bit younger than me, but he's seen some shit. And this is like, if you just bring up this picture now, Sam, this is like a live reaction of him getting the news that Yam has joined the fucking team. Unbelievable, isn't it, man? Like, just look how fucking miserable he is. Oh, it's brilliant. Just like, it does look a bit like a Turkish Vince. <laughs> <laughs> Except he hasn't retired yet, of course. <laughs> but, you know, next move. I tell you, we've been breaking Vince's balls about that. that that'll, that'll die out in a few yeah, months. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course it will. Yeah. I mean, yeah. sooner or later, it won't be relevant, so. <laughs> I don't want to bring it up anymore, so. <laughs> I don't know. I'm pu- Listen, I'm pulling for him, but I don't have any control over his career. He's fucking that up himself. I'm telling you <laughs> to do it better. Do a better job. Have some self respect than that. Stop being a fucking mess. <laughs> <laughs> Come what on, is wrong with this guy? <laughs> mate, we're fucking friends like you. Yeah, Who's fucking him. enemies, mate? Love him. Love him. <laughs> love him. <laughs> uh, you're fucking. You hurt my fucking feelings with that one, like. Um. Anyway, get a fucking few WKDs in here. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want me to do? You harsh and marbles now, you motherfucking. Leave all that shit at home with your wife. <laughs> Let me live. Let me live, motherfucker. <laughs> Love you. Right. <laughs> oh, mate. Right. $100 questions. Uh, we had one. Remember, if you're a, a patron, you can pay $100 and you get to ask us uh, questions and that, and we answer them. That's the process. Uh, so Jerky's Minion asks, since it's the start of the year, who do both of you predict will be a breakout player this year? So I'm guessing by breakout, that doesn't just mean they, they're unknown and they become known. No, or rather, they one, could the be problem. known, but they yeah. perform at a much... Yeah, yeah, yeah. for me, it's more like... For me, this really should be like most improved player because it's, it's a lot easier for people to understand. I mean, I, I, funny, I saw you argue with him the other day on Twitter, but that absolute cretin who used to work for Vakam... In the early days of CSGO, oh, right? Dorian, like what's his face? Yeah. In 2013 in CSGO, for anyone who doesn't know, the storyline of the French scene was you had the Very Games team, which was amazing. And then Shox started playing heavily CSGO again and obviously being a legendary source player, but hadn't been in that Very Games team for like a couple of years because of it being kicked out of the squad, you know. And what happened was Shox was like unreal individually played for, I think it was Imaginary was the French team at the time he played for. And then he worked his way and eventually got recruited by Very Games and then became the best player in the entire world and that's part of why very games like usurped nip so i gave shocks breakout cs goal player of the year in my end of year awards and mm. this con is so stupid his logic was it is impossible for shocks to be a breakout player in cs goal because he was already a top pro in source so by this guy's logic, if like Michael Jordan had gone to baseball and become the best player, you can't mm. say like he's, you know, most improved like rookie or something. How could he be a rookie? He played a different game. It's like the logic doesn't even make sense. So I, that's why you have to be very careful. It's better to just say most improved. Like, because as we say in here, breakout really is going to be the guy that no one knows that makes it in six months. But since he, no one knows him, we can't predict it, can we? We don't know who that could be. So instead, I think we should pick someone who's already established, but like this is their year. This is the year where they go off, they become like twice as good or they become a star player or something. So who, who do you think's in the mix for that? It's a tough one. I mean, just to talk about that cunt for two seconds. 
Um, Absolutely he... right of a human being as well. It's completely well, worthless as well. Did about three articles ever, so whatever. Yeah, no, but this is this is what he tweeted, right? So he, um, obviously I did that Fortnite tournament, which went over pretty well, you know? And um, he said that, oh, I tuned in to see a Fortnite tournament. And who do I see? Richard Lewis. Z, 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 I mean, right? pause, pause right there. So who yeah. who's failing in life then? You, random shitter, not even involved in esports anymore, still tuning into esports tournaments, and you see Richard. Sounds like your life's the one that sucks. Um, but yeah, what happened? So, okay, this all dates back. This is what's really weird about it. So back when I used to run Cadre, there was like two, two sort of beefs if you like right and one of them was uh, obviously hltv because we all know what that nomad has something wrong of with course it. yeah um for anyone and, like, wondering by the way and thinking this is something specific to me and richard who are known to you know occasionally not get along with people no no it basically went like this in 1.6 there was hltv.org and then there was every site that they uh, themselves created a rivalry and beef with that half of them didn't even want beef they were just yeah. the biggest cons ever basically yeah, well, it, it, and, you know, there was a lot of that. It sort of permeated uh, into the, um, you know, 1.6 versus CSS. Of course. You know, Counter-Strike sure. Source rivalry, which, you know, I don't even, I've never really understood why there was so much beef there. It was always, like, oh, 1.6 is the most skilled game. And, uh, and all right, fucking play it then. Play it then. This is the newer game. This is what we're playing. You play that. I mean, who gives sure. a fuck, right? Brood War players and StarCraft 2 players sort of seem to coexist without too much uh of that sort of argumentation um but in 1.6 and css it was very heated i mean the start of cs go right it was like when nip started dominating it was the very games players that, ah you're all source noobs i eat shit you know um so anyway uh hltv we always had a beef i mean to the point where they they told some outrageous lies i'm pretty sure it was hltv that spread the fucking rumor probably it's nomad because i do get on with some other writers over there and guys like peter and stuff um pro probably it's nomad but there was a rumor that seemed to take root in the 1.6 community that i was the sole reason that cgs didn't use 1.6 and use counter-strike source even though i i played no managerial part in that i was like a feature writer for them as very low on the on the pyramid, you know, uh, but apparently it was all me. It was evil Richard Lewis, uh, and and this started this like running meme about you know Cad Dread, Cad Dead. They wanted to like beat our website. It was like all very childish looking back, but all the most venomous stuff all came from Nomad. Like I said, you know, how, how, like there would be. Uh, I told you about that famous thread they had on HLTV on the forums where an anonymous account basically posted, "I have evidence Richard Lewis is a pedophile, and I will post it back here in four hours." And they didn't delete it. <laughs> they just left that there for four hours on the on the basis that, well, what if he, what if this guy does produce evidence? And of course, didn't because I'm not. Um, so that was the level they operated at, right? And I was always like, you know, why? I, I was always <laughs> I, I criticizing them. Box on that part. Keep going. <laughs> Thank you very much, Duncan. Um, and and uh, <laughs> um, you know, but I was always criticized. I you know I was wasn't innocent in it. I I, I <laughs> obviously oh, was of the crime that. It yeah, all of that. <laughs> I was innocent Don't of that. that. Time stamp yeah. that time. I, I was, I was, I, I, like, I, I had my digs back at them too, right? Like, I criticized, like, Nomad and the website, and they didn't understand breaking news. They never broke any stories. Like, famously, Lerpus said he didn't consider it journalism. He's a believer that we should wait for organizational announcements and everything else. Well, you found your way to the right place in the end then. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you know, we, we had a lot of beef, and it got heated. They, they accused us of, like, denying them press access to a heaven media event one time, which was a lie. They didn't apply for press credentials because they, they thought they would get they invited. Would get yeah, yeah, they just assumed they would get it, and then they applied too late, and we had a bunch of local media in. And they were like, well, it's only one table we want. It's like, well, yeah, space is at a fucking premium, you know? And they published on uh, you know that we'd we'd withheld um you know this uh this press pass from them so we had loads of beef with them but then this other website and this is what's inexplicable was vacom this tiny french language website right which to me it which just, isn't even it, competitive because as you say no, it's french it's language in, they it's weren't in even french. doing english it's in french they yeah. didn't do any translation so how would it ever be a rival to a european portal that's you, you fucking prime primarily in english um you know and primarily with an all english speaking staff although we did have reporters from all around the world and obviously the french team was a big part of cs source because they had the best teams and the best players but like it just never was a rivalry to me but these guys were so fucking mentally ill about the rivalry that even when i used to play games we would get like vacom reporters would like turn up 
in our like games, like random mixes, we would all play with each other, and they would they would like be just spamming like nonstop abuse, like you know, you know, all the classic French insults and how they were, you know, our website was gonna die, and it was like they were that fucking mental about it. So anyway, I met up with them at this event. Now, back, I don't know if people notice about me. I used to be a very confrontational young man. Um, and if people like constantly goaded me online, the first people I would seek out at events was them and be like, what's up? Like, let's just have a chat then. Do you want, just repeat it, please. Like, just so I know you've got a fucking set. Just so I know, right? And I went up to that table with the Dorians and all these Vacan pussies who've been riding me for years there. They took me out for dinner, mate. They took me out for dinner. They were buying me drinks. Oh, no, it is just French sense of humor. Yes, they're buying me fucking drinks like a bunch of fucking pussies. And because they got so fucking cuckolded by that, they waited until after the event, slunk back to their fucking sewers or rocks or wherever the fuck they live, and then started dogging me out again online. And this Dorian has been the worst offender. And it's like, listen, all you got to do to beat me, just go and achieve more. And then like, I, then I, I get cooked, right? This guy's done fuck all, except when he had beef, you took me out and bought my drinks all night, you little fucking pussy. You know what I mean? What a fucking clown. So yeah, just wanted to tell that story. Commit that to posterity in case I die. Um, but yeah, what an absolute little bitch, right? And like you say, still, still talking about me. Now about the player that's going to blow up and have a breakout year. Um, it's, it's, it's a tough one for me because the obvious instance, I would say, is going to be Zewu. Oh, Zewu's an obvious one, yeah. Yeah, it's too obvious. I mean, you know, you want to you wanna say something obscure, but I think as Vitality gets to more and more events, Zewu is, you know, while we're talking about French people, I think Zewu is just going to be like, boom, this is, this is where he arrives. Um, and uh, I, think, I think it's a pretty safe pick. I think, you know, the only question mark is how is he going to play consistently at big events? against top tier opposition, which we don't have a data set for. I think as Vitality get to more and more events, we'll have that data set and we'll see that Zebu's pretty fucking good. Um so there's that. I can't count Sergey. Um Sergey already again, did blow up that doesn't really count. Yeah, either. exactly, exactly. And then maybe maybe Brolan to a certain degree, because I don't think he's had the sure. massive breakout. But I think he's on the precipice. Because the other but, thing you can do to me is really this category just becomes pick young players who have yet to yeah. play like world class counts like who could make it. So for example, even though people are already when I say this going to say he's already broken out, it's like you're not listening to what I'm saying. I would mm. say like Ethan from NRG is a good example because as yeah. much as everyone rates him, I think he's still actually has so much more to show. Like there's so many games I've seen where he didn't do shit. Where I'm like, fuck the fuck, when's he going to step forward? So bear in mind how young he is and how he's still only a couple of years in. I could see him doing like that. You know, level goes up 10% and then you become a much better player. I think that's going to be a good shout. Likewise, Rops in our sports had kind of a down half of the latter like half of the year, but so young, mm. you never know when someone like that's going to go to the next level as players like Twists have for other teams. So these are going to be considerations. Who else would be out there, do you think? I, I, I'm, I'm struggling because the criteria is sort of like, um, you know, it's it very, very vague. I mean, the one that we've talked about, and I don't think he's going to have a breakout year, but you brought him up in your video. I mean, we're talking about Refresh. I kind of say Refresh is broken out now. I don't think you can include him in 2019. He had his breakout very late in 2018, and by a breakout, let's just assess what I mean by that. He stood out on a bad team. He was a stand-in for a, a decent team, and then he got a move to a top-tier esports organization. That that's breaking out by any fucking stretch. Okay, I'll tell you who I could. So pick. it would be starving would be a, a choice because he hasn't done anything sure. yet on that Fragster team. When you did your video on it, there was a lot of people saying, "Well, why why are you giving starving like a, a lot of love?" And it's like he is inconsistent, man. But you can see the pieces there. And again, remember, he's sixteen. Sure, of course. Uh, so, but but do I think he'll have the breakout? Well, probably not because I don't think he's going to get on a good enough team to. To take his game at the next level by the looks of things. Which I I'll tell you the shame. player I think could do it, okay? And obviously, mm. th when you hear the, the caveat, the caveat can ruin this immediately, which is if indeed that Virtus Pro lineup gets made, then I'm still waiting for Snatchy to do what he did when he was in the AGO team briefly. If that guy can actually bring his game, he didn't in this Virtus Pro. When I saw him play in AGO and I was watching all the games before I did my video when I, he was announced to Virtus Pro, I thought he was going to be the fucking truth. This guy looked really good. So I still feel like he could get his shit together and be a much, much better player than people saw in Virtus Pro. Yeah. Well, 
There we go. I think that answers the question. We don't have any more, do we, Sam? Just jerk. No, nah, that's it, mate. All right, then. Well, fuck it. We can wrap up the show before Duncan gets us all into trouble. Let's try. Um, if it hasn't already. So, of course, uh, shout out to our sponsor, Rivalry.gg. Go to Rivalry.gg slash RLS. $350 of VIP bonuses await you if you do. Um, and, of course, there's the Thunderdome where you can battle to the death uh, in a safe, ethical environment for gambling. Go to rivalry.gg slash Thunderdome for a chance to win $100,000. And, of course, our patrons, the people that dangle the Skrilla so Duncan gets out of bed. Uh, these are the people who make it happen. So our $100 patrons, Jerky's Minion, Botvik, a new name here, uh, Kashinath. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, and Detlef Insomniac. And our $50 patrons, Manuel Stockley, Rekovic on Steam, Sard Sawar, Pete Bidstrup, Cal, TC Owens, Watch Doge, Carve, Roosty, Ditter Dornov Christensen, Nastradamus, Marcus Kionpa, Madsen, Colin Penny, Benakagi Assassin, and William Southern. And as I've said, me and Duncan are monitoring the Patreon situation closely. If you give on pay Patreon and you feel that they're Policies as a company mean that you can't do it because I've had a few emails from this. Take your money away. Absolutely. That's your Just right contact us and we'll let you pay Palace directly. So we'll sort everything out for you. And you know what? We'll give you a discount, whatever they used to take. Uh, but yeah, basically, uh, you know, if you, if you do feel compelled to withdraw the money, we'll, we'll, we'll have a look and see, see how things are panning out. We don't have any plans to end the podcast, uh, but obviously, you know, we, we'll... We'll revise things. We'll we'll keep it monitored. But you should always vote with your conscience and your wallets. Uh, so there you have it. So thanks to Duncan. Thanks to Sam. We start out 2019 in fine fashion. Thanks to all of you for tuning in. And we will see you sometime next week on By the Numbers. Peace. <laughs>